All right, we are all set. Okay. All right, thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, welcome City Planning Commission members. Um, tonight you are conducting a special meeting in your role as the steering committee for the zoning alignment project. At this meeting, you will continue the conversation that you started at your regularly scheduled meeting on April 25th. Prior to April 25th, staff sent you a copy of the public comments received on the ZAP from its commencement through April 15th. Along with the comments, staff put together a summary of the issues that seemed to rise to the top from the comments that we heard and read most often during the last several months. Uh, since the meeting on the 25th, staff slightly revised the summary and added some discussion questions to help facilitate your meeting tonight. We sent you that summary earlier today and we added it to the City Planning Commission website as well. Staff is here tonight to answer questions that you may have and to document your discussion. Um, we have here with us tonight myself, Roseanne Khalil, Manager of Zoning. We also have Kevin Kelly, Manager of Planning, Johanna Brennan, City Attorney, Jermaine Kirkmeyer, former manager of planning and zoning, and Kate Powers, senior city planner. We also have Tom Worth here, I see, who is also city attorney and one that you're familiar with in his role uh, advising your board. Uh, with that brief introduction, and before we get started with your discussion, um, do we have any questions for staff? Okay, all right, so I think um, you should all have the revised version of, <clears throat> excuse me, the comments and responses that we got um, that we started reviewing last week. Um, I'm gonna scroll to the top of that. I'm not, should I, should I share my screen? Does everybody have a copy in front of them? Because I prefer not to share if I don't need to, so we can sort of try to have a discussion. Does everybody have it? Anybody not? I'm seeing a thumbs up, a couple of thumbs up. Okay. So, Roseanne, I just want to clarify that this was some, this was the conversation they started uh, a couple weeks ago, yeah. not last week. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, last time we were together. Um, okay. So we had sort of already resolved a question. The first thing, which was the ADUs and duplexes. Is there any reason to revisit that at this point? We sort of, I think we resolved that last week that we were going to stick with the 2034 plan and sort of leave that off of the zap for now. Any changes of heart there? Okay, so where we got bogged down and where we um, now have additional information for you is we were discussing the legalization of three plus dwellings in LDR. Um, so just to refresh everybody, the discussion was that in LDR, we are proposing to allow legal two families to, um, <clears throat> that uh, to be reconstructed if they are destroyed. So to give them certain rights so that if something happened to them, they could be rebuilt. Again, only, only the legal ones. Um, there was a question raised as to whether we should also do that for three or four family dwellings as well in LDR. Um, there was a discussion had about how much would this affect everything? And we provided you with a map, and I may just share this briefly for the benefit of the streaming. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm getting some small panels. Thank you. I just want to share my screen. Thank you. Okay. So hopefully you can all see uh, a map now. This is three and four family homes. And Kate, I'll let you tell me if they can't because I've lost everybody's little window. Um, but what you can see here is the, the sort of lime green is the LDR areas on the map and the red blocks are three and four families. Um, we've also got some blue blocks here, which are the three and fours that are not in LDR. So you can see we've got a couple up here in the beach area, little block here, um, a smattering up here in this area, and then a really sort of dispersed, little tiny concentration there, but a real dispersed scattering around um, a few areas, but you can see where the density of it is and that reflects where we've uh, moved the zoning to MDR. Um, so it's not uh, percentage wise, it's a very small uh, percentage of these areas. And um, if anyone wants, I can zoom in on an area, uh, but this will give you uh, an idea of the scope of what we're talking about. 
whether or not to allow these uh, legal three and four families that are within LDR to retain their rights in the event that they burned out or are destroyed in some other manner. So with that, I would yeah. like to open the discussion and see if that answers some of the questions some of you had last time. Roseanne, just to clarify, we're also saying that they would retain their rights if they're vacant for more than nine months, correct? Yes, sorry. Yes, vacancy and uh, in the event they're destroyed. Uh, so, normally, this is, uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was saying this is Commissioner Rebholtz, and this map helps me quite a bit. And, um, and uh, it, it does make sense if these things are legally um, existing that um, it's tough to do anything else with them if they you know, become vacant for that nine months. And, and if they were to burn down, it's, it's a, a challenging loss. And it sounds like the, the transfer selling them becomes very difficult if they uh, don't have some rights under the zoning. So um, I, I'm comfortable with, um, I guess, including threes and fours personally in that um, retaining rights uh, similar to the two families. I second Steve. I think threes and fours still make sense to me. Anything over than that, anything over that is more traditionally commercially oriented, in my opinion. Okay. Um, if there um, are, go ahead. Yep. Wasn't there sort of an issue of if you're going to do it for residential, why don't you do it for any other non conforming uses? So we do have um, for the non commercial the non-residential buildings in residential districts, we do have in the new code some basic rights to uses. Um, there are limitations, but those are part of the use chart and the use matrix that we released in the first batch of code. So this sort of completes the cycle by um, acknowledging some residential uses that should get to retain their non-conforming rights. So we do have some stuff for, for the non-residential. And, and that is something new with this proposed code. Currently, they would be non-conforming, but we recognize that these buildings, um, you know, it's it's we, we're putting them through a lot of uh, bureaucracy right now to to re-establish a use in those buildings. So we'd like to give them some built-as non-conforming rights on the use chart. So that's why we have that. Like um, Roseanne was just saying, we have a new um, a column now that says. Remember those buildings that are built as they're going to be allowed certain rights as of right without any bureaucracy whatsoever. Um, well, outside of the building permit process, but um, they wouldn't have to go through um, a certificate of nonconformity and then a, a special permit or a variance, anything like that. Okay, so this doesn't non they're not, you're not going to get into a situation where somebody has a non-conforming commercial building and they're saying, hey, you're letting these three and four bedroom unit, uh, three and four unit buildings get by and you know, be rebuilt after they're burned down, but we can't. Uh, you see what I mean? I'm just wondering, yeah. does it open up a, you know, a whole big thing or is it just would totally be limited to three and four? Yeah, we already accounted for that. That was something we started out with um, in terms of trying to make the code more flexible, recognize built as status of some of the of the properties um, and, and, you know, keep our neighborhoods um, with some of that mix that we're looking for, for those pre existing commercial buildings. So, so we already that was already something fundamental to the, the code that we've already released. So the thing we're talking about with the three and four is beyond what we've already um, release to the community. So this would be a change. I also think that it's fair to say that um, these are residential nonconformities in residential districts. And I think there is a line between uh, residential uses in residential districts and nonconforming commercial uses in residential districts. Are there any more comments? Otherwise, I think I might just ask for a, a show of hands um, if everyone agrees with the staff approach to this, which is to add the rights for three and four families. Any other comments? Okay, could you all just give me a, a thumbs up if you agree with, with the staff approach to this? One, two, 
And is there anyone who wants to give me a thumbs down? Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to abstain because I wasn't here at the last meeting and I'm just continuing the discussion of which I wasn't previously a part. So I'll keep listening, but uh, my vote would not be helpful. Okay. I'm sorry, Commissioner Mazza, you were a thumbs up? Yeah. Oh, a thumbs down. That's what I was worried about. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, the next uh, question has to do or comment has to do with the FMU district, which is the, um, the district where we are trying to uh, promote the use of our, some of our older industrial buildings. Um, these are some large obsolete buildings. Um, there were some concerns raised about um, the proximity, uh, so the flexibility of uses in this district, and some of them are right up against residential districts. Uh, we did make some changes to this. Um, we found some errors in the use chart, particularly related to the RC column and the IND column. When it came to sexually oriented businesses, we've corrected those. Um, in addition, um, we made a change to emergency shelters so that they are prohibited within 200 feet of a res residential district boundary. Um, we feel that that addresses most, uh, the majority of the comments we received uh, regarding those uses, uh, particularly the correction to the sexually oriented businesses. And um, we would like to proceed that way. And we are looking to see if there are any questions or comments from the, the commission on that. Can you correct me if I'm wrong on this? I was reading through the the changes in the sexually oriented business definitions, or at least I think it. I think the correction, if I'm not mistaken, was that it was becoming more prohibited, not less. Correct? It was more. It was more restrictive, not less restrictive. Is that right? Uh, I think it was a combination of both things. We we the column the the uses got shifted into the RC column, which is a, a zone that they're not intended to be in, which makes it. Um, less restrictive, but is also a zone that is that is very small in footprint. So it made it more restrictive in that sense. Um, and that was shifted over to IND, which is where it was meant to be. So um, it is now uh, no longer an RC, which means the proximity to residential problem has gone away. But within IND, there's much more land mass that is IND than RC. So it's in a sense expanded there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess, but I think I have an internal issue with any sort of proximity issues with the sexually oriented business, and maybe it's because of the de definition of a sexually oriented business. Um, I'm also coming hot off the heels of going to a rally for abortion rights, so I am like gun ho about making sure that sex ed is like in everybody's faces, if it or accessible at the very least, instead of being pushed to the fringes. Um, and so I, I don't know, maybe. That, I, I was spending a lot of time thinking about sexually oriented businesses as well and how the zone, previous zoning code, um, and by extension, I think even this one is still relatively prohibitive um, in, in talking about these businesses and kind of relegating them to places where pedestrian traffic is not common. Um, you have to drive to get to these lo locations. Uh, and it made me think a lot about travels that I've been fortunate enough to have in larger metro centers and how properly and again, this is where the definition gets hairy. Um, yes, a sexually oriented business, I guess, if you're talking about a small retail operation, but an education based type of facility um, creates neighborhoods that thrive in very liberal places. I think of Castro District in San Francisco. Um, I think of other uh, locations in very liberal cities, New York City and Brooklyn specifically, um, where these businesses do exceptionally well and they're community based and they're community oriented. And so maybe there's a separation or maybe we should just look at a little bit more of like what we're calling those community based things versus not. And for the record, um, I I read the definitions a month and a half ago, so they're not very fresh. You may have already accounted for this, in which case, great work. Um, but these were my concerns as I was just thinking about the, those definitions and, and being prohibitive versus trying to accommodate um, changes. Retail has changed. We all know that retail has changed drastically. And so calling a sexually oriented business, a retail thing that can't happen or needs to only happen in industrial spaces when nine times out of 10 to be a retail, uh, successful retail business these days, you have to have a million different value adds to have it make sense and be successful anyway. Um, it's just, it seems a little imbalanced to me um, based on the old definition. 
So, so I can, I can address some of that. Um, with respect to the retail, we are, the, the use table as we've corrected it, shows that limited retail, a limited adult retail. So that's going to have some of the, some of the, um, you know, the, the items that maybe aren't, um, maybe, I don't know, they're, they're going to be, it's going to be a little lighter on the um, sexually orientedness of it. Um, but those are going to be permitted as of right in the neighborhood mixed use district and permitted as of right within a, an existing building, which is what predominantly is in the FMU, um, in the FMU, and then the on you know like an unlimited adult retail store would also be permitted in the FMU with their next existing building. So they haven't been excluded entirely from our mixed use districts from from a limited retail perspective. Um, so that's a little, I think that's kind of getting to your issue. The second thing is you were talking about is, and I'm not aware of this use you're talking about, but it sounds to me like it would fit more into a community center or a um, maybe an educational facility, both of which would be allowed pretty much anywhere, um, maybe in the, in the low density and medium density. I'm, I'm not looking at that right now, but uh, maybe in a, as a special permit. So I think, I think that community center aspect would be included there. Um, and then, then, like I said, the limited retail and the retail is, is a little more permissive than, you know, a, um, a, an adult movie theater or, you know, something like that. Got it. Okay. And that's, yeah, I think, I think the hangup is, I don't know. I, I don't know how many adult movie theaters are opening these days anyway, but like I, I'm thinking specifically about the businesses that um, that are thriving in, in uh, Kensington Market in Toronto or Cabbage Town in Toronto, um, where you you walk by and they've got um, I, I really do think that these businesses are like I've talked to you know a bunch of peers and maybe this is a generational thing, but I've talked to a bunch of peers who would love to have these businesses here. Um, but when we look at the zoning code, it's like, oh, you can only do it way out here. And like, that's never going to get pedestrian traffic. This would be a great fit for the South Wedge. This would be a great fit for uh, Neighborhood of the Arts, where it's more programming. It's more community-based facilities. Yes, there's a retail element as a part of it, but it's more about like, how do we facilitate community in that space? Um, so you possibly just answered it for me, Doreen. And Roseanne, do you have um, access to a quick map you can share, screen share for the FMU? Just so we can uh, see what spite sites yeah. specifically we're talking about. Let me. Okay, let me share again. This is a map for another subject, but it's got all the districts on it. Uh, where's my share? There we go. So you should see a map. Um, the dark brown areas are FMU. Uh, again, um, adult uh, store and limited store is permitted uh, in an existing building uh, in these districts. Again, these districts are in. Uh, intended to promote the reoccupation of um, older industrial buildings. The RC, which is the red, which is here, a um, little bit up top there, um, those also permit the adult store and the adult store limited. And then the um, NMU, which is, I need to bump this up a little bit. No, nope, that's not working. <laughs> uh, is, the, is the sort of RNG areas here, um, the neighborhood mixed use, and that allows only the limited adult store. When you get to the um, escort agencies, the movie theaters, and, and those sort of spaces, it's the gray industrial district. And if the use that we're talking about, Brad, that you're talking about ends up getting classified as a community center, um, that would be permitted as of right in most districts, uh, so well, definitely the FMU and a special permit in the low and medium density residential. Got it. Awesome. Thank you for letting me spend a little bit of extra time on this one. It was hanging on from a previous conversation I had, so I appreciate it. Sure. No problem. Okay. Um, so again, I'm going to ask uh, if there's any more discussion. We can have some more discussion on it, but I'm looking to, to see if uh, again, thumbs up if everyone's in agreement with um, our approach to this and, and how we're proceeding with this. Got a thumbs up. Thank you, Gino. And, and we'll know more, like it says in the report, 
um, when the district regulations and design regulations are coming out in the next, actually the next month, we'll see more um, protections in the FMU that people didn't have the information on when they made these comments. Okay, I think uh, Commissioner Mauser and Harding, I didn't see whether you were a sum up or sum down. I'm gonna take the same position as last time. Just okay, so out. Commissioner Harding, this is the first time we're discussing this with anyone in this group. So I think we, we would really like you to participate. I'm, I'm just not comfortable not having the context of the full meeting on the 25th. So I'd really like to just be an observer. So we didn't have a full meeting on this. We just started going through this list and we got only to the second sec second question before we ran out of time. It was only 30 minutes that we had. Yeah. So we didn't have any time to spend on this. They, they literally have not talked about this. So, I mean, is there more information you need? I mean, we, we are really looking for feedback from everyone on, on the, the approach we're taking with the comments. I, I just to reiterate, maybe Commissioner Harding, this might make you feel more comfortable, but um, we, we did make a lot of changes on the, um, this shows, you know, some of the more substantive changes, but um, we did revisit the FMU in response to people's concerns about it, because it is a new district and it takes up, you know, quite a bit of space in the city. So we wanted to make sure we, we read the comments. So um, we've, we've highlighted some of the bigger changes, but there are, are quite a few changes that we're gonna see when we release the whole code as corrected as a result of public comment. I mean, Roseanne, we could wait. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything really specific, as, aside from, I guess what we, talked about in this in this paragraph there's really we could get buy-in on just what we have in this paragraph so that might make you more um commissioner harding that might make you more comfortable if it's just on these things that we're talking about here in this report this couple paragraphs i mean i'm comfortable with the discussion but i'm just not comfortable voting on the continuation of a discussion of which i wasn't previously a part so I'm really kind of going at your word that nothing else was discussed. I wasn't there to know. And I, I'm, I'm not comfortable making that representation. It's my vote on the record I, to which I have to be held accountable. So I, I, I'm okay. happy to listen and participate at, as best that I can, but I, I just, it doesn't, and I, I, Doreen, I appreciate what you're saying. It just doesn't change my level of comfort with a vote on the record. So are you not gonna vote for anything even though none of it was discussed? I mean, they didn't talk about it. So this is the first time it's being discussed by the Planning Commission. Maybe the other members need to affirm that that what it, these things were not discussed on April 25th. Yeah, that this is Steve Rebels. That's correct. We, we got through one item one and two and we ran out of time. And it was decided that after those two items, we didn't discuss any others and we would reconvene with a focused agenda and more time to talk about the remainder of the items or to, to re go over those two items and talk about the remainder. So okay. this FMU district, we have not as a group talked about it at all. We have had you know the information for some time, but there's been no um, commission discussion about this FMU district item until tonight. Well, all right. I thought I had a pretty good idea of what all the sexually oriented businesses were, but when Brad brought his discussion into this, I'm like, well, maybe I don't really have a handle on it. He had a good point about there probably aren't going to be any theaters anymore, but I mean, is this, you know, does this include Planned Parenthood places or, you know? No, what? that would be a clinic. That would be a clinic. Okay. I mean, you know, so this is really just sort of the, uh, um, I can give you the list. Um, hold on. Yeah. So this includes adult arcade, adult mm -hmm. cabaret, mm -hmm. adult movie theater, adult retail store, adult retail store limited. So you don't just do adult sales, you do other sales as well. Adult video viewing booth and escort agency. Those are the businesses we're talking about. Those are what we define as sexually oriented businesses in the city. And to uh, shoot a little more light on that as well is um, we did not change any of the definitions at all 
um, in, in the zoning code because, and Johanna, you could probably contribute to this, but we, we didn't change any definitions because there, you know, this is a, this is a complicated issue and we've been, there's, there's all kinds of case law on this. And so we didn't change anything in the, in, in terms of definitions. The only thing we were thinking about is because we have a new district called the flexible mixed use, that's a new district. Um, we had to figure out how to, how to incorporate the sexually oriented businesses into the use table for that new district. And so that's what we did. And there was a mistake in what was originally provided to the community and they pointed it out to us. So we had to go through and make those changes that we've talked about today. Um, and um, other than that, I don't think we've changed anything else with respect to the uses, the definitions and what district they're permitted in. And, and just to clarify, the, these, these votes are to let us know that we are going in the right direction. This is not a vote to adopt the code. It's not a vote to a, approve of everything. It's, it's a vote to say, okay, so these are the comments we're getting. And this is the, this is the strategy that, that we are taking um, in order to move forward and resolve these issues. Um, and we are asking for your vote on whether or not we are proceeding in the right direction because you are our steering committee and ultimately you review our work. And you will see this again. Um, again, you'll see all the changes at a later date um, as part of the draft environmental impact statement later in the year. So, I mean, Roseanne, so, maybe, maybe we don't- Commissioner Mauser and Harding, are you at all comfortable with giving me a thumbs up or thumbs well, down? Well, I think- Doreen is saying that basically it's not changing from the previous code. It's not, no, with the exception of the new district that we had to, to accommodate. Mixed use district. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, but really what that's kind of doing is is mimicking, um, mimicking the uh, neighborhood mixed use allowance. The, yes. um, the only difference is uh, both will allow adult retail store limited, mm -hmm. but um, the adult, the full on adult retail store is not permitted in the neighborhood mixed use, just the yeah. flexible only mixed use limit. in an existing building. And we put it in the existing building because the whole idea of the FMU really is to give, give more flexibility for these big old industrial buildings that really have a hard time getting a reuse for and they sit vacant and they, dilap they get dilapidated. So, so we were trying to think, you know, how do we make this as flexible as possible to get these buildings reoccupied and, and then while still protecting neighboring districts. So we've, it's a balance we've tried to create and that's why we've been somewhat, you know, we're more limiting than, than other districts um, than the industrial district, no, I'm sorry, more limiting, yes, than the industrial district, but, but a little bit more permissive than the neighborhood mixed use, which is right in our little mixed use corridors, you know, directly adjacent to residential districts. So that was the idea um, with the FMU in sexually oriented businesses. We also, um, wasn't, there was another concern about allowing car sales um, and we took that out um, when it's adjacent to residential uses and drive-through restaurants as well. So we just tried to rein it in a little bit because of people's concerns about adjacency. Can you just delete, just delete drive-throughs, just get rid of them. <laughs> well, dry, dry things are going to be discussed later on. So I'd like to kind of leave that to the side because that comes up later on. Yep. Okay. So are we generally we, headed in the right direction with making the FMU um, a little bit more protected than what originally was released to the public, but still allowing that flexibility? Are we okay with that level of direction? Yeah. Yeah. Commissioner okay. Harding? Uh, no. Sure. I, I don't, I, I guess I don't really have a choice. Uh, okay. I guess. Yep. Okay. Well, I, I think just uh, this is, the, there is a choice. Um, you know, you've got the information 
and um, you've got a voice. So, so no one should feel like they, they have to go, you know, with, with the group. Yeah. You can say no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Could I, I think, I I think the concern is if, if you abstain for the reason of it having not been discussed it, or having been discussed before, it wasn't discussed before. So if, if your reason for abstaining is that it was discussed before, it never was. Uh, this is the first time the commission, if your reason for you know wanting to vote differently is based on your review of the information and um, a different opinion, you, you know, you that should, that should be heard. It, it absolutely should be heard. No one should feel forced into a, a making a decision. I understand. I've just, I've expressed my discomfort with taking a position and I, I guess I'm not allowed to not take a position. So I'll say, yes, that's well, fine. I, I guess the fear is. I don't, I, it's, it's fine. I, I, I don't okay. want to continue the discussion. It, okay. it is what it is. Okay. All right. Then I'm going to move on to the next one, which is parking regulations. Um, we put this one in here. Um, for a very brief discussion because we haven't actually released the parking section yet. Um, but just to get confirmation uh, from the group that, um, you know, when it, the issue is um, in parking requirements, if parking is eliminated, if we eliminate minimum parking requirements, there was suggestion that on site parking provisions will negatively impact residential streets, a particular concern border areas. So where you have residential districts next to non-residential districts. If the non-residential districts do not have parking requirements, then it could flow into the residential districts. Um, 2034 is pretty clear on eliminating parking requirements um, in commercial districts and you know, changing uh, the, the um, focus on providing site land area for unnecessary parking. Um, and I guess this is just more of a general question. We are following 2034 in this and um, just looking to see if there are any concerns that um, things may have changed or we should not be, we should be deviating from the plan. And we only raise it because a lot of people raised, uh, raised this concern. So we felt we need to bring it to the table, but our intention is to stick with 2034 and continue down this path. And we're going to we're going to be um, releasing the parking regulations um, in the third batch. They'll be coming out in August or September. So um, you don't really have the benefit of what's been written. So we're just asking because based on you probably saw all the comments we received on parking. So we just like Rose had said, we're just looking for um, a thumbs up or thumbs down on the direction that 2034 gives us. And sorry, just to distill that further, 2030, the essence of 2034 is no parking requirements generally for commercial uses. Is that correct? For commercial districts. Commercial districts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mixed, mixed use well, districts for uh, buildings that are um, below a certain size. Um, so if they're above a certain square footage that we wouldn't necessarily have parking requirements, but it would trigger uh, an in-depth look at how all transportation modes are being accommodated, which might suggest like, yeah, you really should have a, a fair amount of parking here so that you don't have a huge negative impact on the neighborhood, but that's only for uh, buildings above a certain size. Below that, it, it's just kind of a non-issue. Like we're not, the city wouldn't be in the business of telling businesses how many parking spots they should have. Kevin, do you, any off the, you know, shoot from the hip, any idea on what that square footage is, 25,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, where, where does the line draw? Is it, where is it drawn? We have talked about it internally. Are, uh, are, have we landed on a number folks that uh, were, or does that need to wait until later in the summer? Yeah, we haven't really, I don't, I think we've talked about a particular square footage, but I don't think we've landed on it yet because we've been focusing on this next batch of, of regulations. Got it. Okay. I, I think like, like for, I don't know, in my experience in, in developing small, small commercial stuff, like 10,000 square feet, I would hope does not have to go through that process. 50,000 or a hundred thousand square feet perhaps may. That's it, that in terms of framework of how I would think about it. Okay. Um, yeah. The, the spirit of it, the spirit of it is, you know, what, what type of business and what type of, what scale would start to have, start to have pretty serious negative impacts to adjacent residential side streets. Yeah. You know, you know the armory is kind of the, on East, East Main is sort of the poster child of that. Um, it causes, I mean, it's a great business and a great venue, but they do cause 
a lot of headaches for neighbors. So we want to be mindful of that. Uh, but that's not true of a little bike shop or a coffee shop, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find that sweet spot in the middle. Got it. Yeah. So if, if you, if, if the, if the steering committee, if the planning commission is steering committee, committee want to, if you want to talk amongst yourselves and, and agree on a particular square footage, we would be happy to take that feedback. Right. Um, that'd be great. That would be great feedback for us as we develop these regs. Sure. I have a question or more than a suggestion, a question. Um, why based on square footage and not then uh, based on occupancy of the type right. of business? Yeah. I actually mm -hmm. think that's where we were going now that you mentioned it. I think mm -hmm. we were going with occupancy, um, occupancy postings rather than square footage, or maybe it was both. I, I really honestly don't know where we, if, if we've landed on anything in particular, but we did talk about occupancy because that you're right. I mean, square footage means nothing if it's a warehouse um, and there's three people working there, or if it's a bar that, you know, it takes up 3000 square feet mm -hmm. and, 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 and has a huge occupancy. So yeah, we, that's great feedback. And that's kind of where we were going mm -hmm. with it. So I will say though, part of the issue is there's there's two issues with basing it on occupancy and one is that the building once the building is physically built the occupancy can change so you're basing it on the first occupancy use of the building um which is not something doesn't mean that you can't do it but um it's a little bit um time dependent um the other thing is um when you have development they don't always know who's going in it's just leasable space um, and for uh, from zoning office to review plans and site plan reviews, uh, we do always know the size of the building's square footage. We don't always know the occupancy. And so to complete a timely review, um, when some of that may be unknown, um, there is, uh, from my point of view, I and mean, it is under discussion, but from my point of view, I, I lean much towards something that we will know at the time the plans are submitted and that staff can easily identify and analyze. So I lean towards the the square footage, but it is it is up for discussion and our consultant Camaras has some opinions on it as well. Roseanne, I'm, I'm probably with you on this one about leaning it towards, um, in, in, in essence, it may be more inclusive versus less inclusive that if you set just an arbitrary number based on size of development, um, it does expedite the approval process. Um, it also like, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm an advocate for like kind of letting things shake out um, as they are. And like, it's gonna be kind of, it's gonna be it's getting to a place where we're focused less on parking is going to be painful, but we have to like take the steps to get there if we want to get there by 2034. So like mm -hmm. <laughs> not trying to regulate businesses by saying what type of parking things they have to have, I think is, is the way to do, is a way to do that. Um, and so like a square footage thing makes sense. I pull, I'm literally shooting from the hip on this in terms of square footage to answer your, your question, Kevin and Doreen. Um, but like, yeah, I don't know. It's for oh, some you reason, 20, 25,000 comes to, comes to mind. I don't know though. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what um, I'm looking at our draft regs that we're, we're, we're throwing around right now. And again, this is draft. We haven't really finished, finalized our discussion on this. It's not been released to the public, but what we were, what we were looking at is, um, Anything above these, these, and this is again just I'm throwing this out there for your, you know, for your own guidance. But places of assembly, so it's something that that's a that's a, a change in use term for building code. A place of assembly with an occupancy posting of more than 75 people, um, or new developments of 20,000 square feet. We went to 20,000, Commissioner Flowers. Uh, 20,000 square feet, but the manager of zoning can waive that for low occupancy uses like a warehouse. So that's kind of where we're going with that. Um, and again, we, we're trying to set these, we're trying to have no, no parking requirements, but in certain cases where it may be an impact to the community, we want to make sure that we look at their plan for mitigating that potential impact. That's what the transportation access plan is that we talked about in 2034. So I just, I, I'm putting that out there at risk of being criticized, but I'm putting it out there so that you have that information in your discussion. Got it. So it sounds like it's like basically certain triggers will, um, or certain things will, will trigger the need for just a thoughtful approach to how are you handling people getting to your location? Um, yeah. and, and I don't even want to talk about parking, right? It is transportation. It is like, 
how many people do you think based on who you're anticipating showing up are going to take the bus? How many people are going to be riding their bikes? And do you have bike racks? Like those types of things. So yeah. that was deliberate. And thank you, Kevin yeah. Kelly, um, because we've always called it like a parking demand analysis yeah. or a parking access. But we specifically stayed away from parking word and said transportation access plan. So it would have that multimodal kind of approach to it. And if um, if the you know commissioners want to make a note of it, if you want to read a little bit more about it, it's on pages 107 to 108 of the, of Rochester 2034 is two pages that kind of dig into this a little bit. And if you want to see that for a little bit more background, some of that is was quoted in the in the summary document that you got, but there's a little bit more to it there. And I sent um, I sent in the in the in the uh, chat just like one sentence that sort of or two sentences that kind of captures that salient point of of what it says in twenty thirty four. If you want to look at that for a reminder, it's also in your summary report that we sent you. But I didn't know if you wanted to see just a, a an excerpt. So I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, based on the the details of the discussion, that it seems like the actual um, goal of approaching this without without minimum parking requirements for commercial uses in commercial districts is kind of something that we're all comfortable with. Is that so? That? I, I well, um, yes and no. I think okay. I think there's a lot there's a lot there, um, and you know, I, I disagree that you know square footage is the right way to go because occupancy is is what's going to drive the transportation need and also time of that occupancy is going to drive, you know, the impact on, on the neighborhoods and especially at those neighborhoods where residential is, is right up against uh, commercial. And, um, you know, I know we'd all love to stop hearing about parking and the problems that parking causes, but that won't make those problems go away. It is, it is an impact. Um, and to kind of, I guess, imagine you know, this future where it's, it's not an impact anymore. I think the reality is next year and then in the next five years, it, it will continue to be an impact. So it feels like there needs to be some, you know, some uh, point where we can recognize that impact and have a way to, to discuss it and, um, and not overburden um, neighborhoods that have been traditionally overburdened by the spillover parking onto their residential streets from businesses that tend to, uh, um, you know, attract large numbers of people in the uh, evening and, and night hours. It just feels like ignoring it doesn't make the problem go away. Um, so, you know, I, I think as, uh, developing that make, threshold is important. Isn't it, yeah. Isn't it possible, though, that it makes like there has to be a pain point for people to make changes in their in the way that they choose to live? Um, and so like just trying to mitigate and make it not painful for people, if the city vision is to make it a more green city, um, I think people need to experience a little bit of that pain. And, and we're only going to be rewriting the zoning code once within the next 15 to 20 years. And so like not making that choice today means you're making that choice for 20 years. No, I, I, I guess um, possibly, but um, I don't know that it's, it's, you know, the city and zoning's purpose to, to cause people, you know, pain. Um, but it, 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 is, is, it is the purpose to get to the 2034 vision, which was already voted on, which says that like so, having a space with less parking is what, what we're all about and finding a green city. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, but I don't think, you know, it's, it's all or nothing. I don't think it's, you know, complete elimination and, you know, have everyone feel the pain. I mean, I think there needs, we need that infrastructure. We, we don't have it for anyone that's tried to take a bus, you know, from my house to, uh, to Monroe Avenue at, at 1030 at night. It's, it's not going to happen, you know. Yeah. And in, in the, February, I'm I'm not likely to ride my bike, and so I'm going to drive, and I'm going to find a parking space on a street that's likely not Monroe Avenue because those spaces are full, and um, or I'm not going to go. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just clarify? I I just want to clarify the vision that's expressed in 2034 around this. Um, it's not an intention to try to flip the switch so that, you know, within a couple of years or even within 15 years that the overwhelming majority of folks are going to choose a walk bike and take transit. Um, we don't, you know, we, we don't have any illusions that that's going to happen um, on a, you know, massive scale and that we're going to eliminate this impact that it, it's, we, we hope that it will um, encourage different choices for some 
percentage of folks, whatever that percentage is. But in addition to that, it's really about not designing our built environment around cars and having car storage take up so much land in our city um, because, and, and not only is it not the highest and best use of our land, but it's also um, oftentimes the zoning staff could speak to this, caused potential businesses to give up on, a, on an idea because they can't meet the parking requirements. So there's an economic development piece to it in addition to hoping to move the needle a little bit in, in terms of people's transportation choices. Yeah, um, and I guess I agree with a lot of it. I'm, I'm, I'm all about trying to remove the parking minimums. That's, that is always my position, it always has been. I think that as we move away, as people start moving remote, uh, some of the occupancy that it was maybe B for offices now could be used for, a lot of you people are using it for either residential or assemblies to do restaurants and things like that. So now if we just only put it on the square footage, then there will be neighborhoods where they are gonna create an assembly where, or a restaurant where that's just gonna overwhelm the, the neighborhood if we if we just do it on square footage, if it's, it's, as people start moving remote, um, these offices will become available. And if they get it as a right, then they could do anything they want. And I'm all about it. I'm all about increasing the um, the uh, um, businesses in the area. But it has to be done understanding that the infrastructure, as uh, Commissioner Stephen said, is also taken in consideration as we move into into a, a bigger city, which I'm all about it. I'm, I'm all about not uh, having parking minimums, but it have to be done thoughtfully, not just based on the square footage. My thoughts. Okay. Yeah, well, so I guess it, for me, the you know the the answer is more in the details than than the concept. The concept is is appropriate, and moving in that direction to me is appropriate. I, I, I could see some key areas where we want to say, wait a minute, this area is just currently overburdened and we ought to think about how we, you know, where we draw this line. Fair enough. And I think what we're asking for tonight is really just to buy into to the intended process. So to, to not have minimums, but to have triggers, right? And we haven't mm -hmm finalize those triggers. Um, if you have some thoughts on what those triggers should be, we're, we're happy to hear it ahead of time. But I think when we when we finalize those sections and we release those sections, then we'll have the more detailed discussion on the triggers uh, that we came up with and whether those triggers are appropriate or sufficient or need to be changed or modified. Um, but the whole idea of not having the minimum, but having a transfer uh, trigger that trigger a transportation access plan that looks holistically at the site where parking is a piece of the site but not driving the site development um, is all we're really asking for buy-in with tonight, which is which is where 2034 is asking us, the direction is asking us to head in. Um, so that's really all that's on the table right now. I, I have a question, well, with regard to details on the transportation access plan thing. In addition to the thresholds for getting there, uh, I think, might consider who, whether there'll be a board reviewing the plans or staff. Uh, and then another question being, um, what would be the criteria for asking for some adjustments? And then the third thing would be what kind of menu of adjustments could the city ask for, for someone that's in a transportation access plan? you know, to try to remedy a little bit of uh, their uh, impact on surrounding neighborhoods. So I think those things would be good to address uh, in, in, you know, when you're fleshing this out. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Um, and we didn't talk about it much, but part of it is also um, to rein in excessive parking. If you drive by a Walmart or a CVS or any of those and see the two thirds empty parking lot. Um, okay, so with that said, are, um, is there anyone who, who wants us to sort of deviate from the path uh, that we're on? Well, I, I think if you have triggers, for example, based on occupancy types, okay, somebody that comes to you saying, I want to develop whatever, they've got an idea, I think, of what occupancies they want to put in there. 
they're not just going to build a, I don't think they're going to build a completely empty building and not have any clue because you're going to build out, if you're building out residential, you know, you know, um, so I think the idea trigger makes a lot of sense there. And if there's any, you know, if there's anything having to do with, you don't, you know, a square foot minimum or maximum that you don't need any parking for, I would tend to make that fairly small that would accommodate the small business owners mainly um, where they wouldn't have to, you know, but as I think uh, um, Milton and, and Steve brought up, uh, it really depends on occupancy and, you know, if it's a bar, yeah, it's going to be issues. So I guess the trigger thing is yeah, I think something to think about, though, is um, if it starts out as a store and then becomes a bar, so the parking is designed for the store, now it becomes a bar. I think we have to look at it second and third use. Well, yeah, yeah, but don't, don't Wouldn't you have a, ch a change of use for that? Yeah. Right. So then are we just creating nonconformities? We have to think, I, th I think when we come up with the triggers or how the tap works or whatever, we also have to think about second uses, not just initial development. Well, yeah, but then if they change the occupancy, then they got, well, fine, but you're going to need X amount of parking. Mm -hmm. They got to come up with it yeah. at that point, or they can't put that in there. Right. I, I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, parking or valets or bike racks or free bus passes or, you know, the whole menu of things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll rent my driveway out, okay? Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I think we're all in agreement that, that we're, we're, we're going in the right direction, but um, we're very interested in what we're using for triggers and uh, for all the details surrounding the tap. Yep. Okay. So I'm counting that as a thumbs up from everyone, so correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. I hope. I hope. All right, thank you. All right, um, drive throughs Okay, so here's the favorite, I think, uh, for a few of you, but drive throughs So um, drive throughs are fairly restricted in the current code and use chart. Um, this was raised as a question by a lot of people. Um, uh, comments were varied. Uh, some applauded the restrictions. Um, comments suggested drive through restaurants should be specially permitted in NMU or specially permitted in IND. So we, we sort of have both sides of the coin here. Um, I just wanna make sure everybody realizes that um, with the use chart, we have distinguished drive through restaurants from other drive throughs So drive through restaurants that have the menu boards and the lights and the speakers and everything else is now distinct from, for instance, the pharmacy drive through or the bank drive through um, so we have separated those and we have limited where the restaurant drive throughs can occur. Um, and the questions that have come up is, or the questions that we're struggling with based on the feedback is, should we allow as of right special permit or prohibit drive through restaurants in BMU, NMU and or FMU? Please note that any built as drive through restaurant would retain its rights to a drive through restaurant use regardless of any likely vacancy. Uh, and we do have a map on this of existing drive throughs So I'm going to share again and show that map. So where we're proposing, well, Roseanne's bringing that up, where we're proposing to allow drive through restaurants right now is only in the flexible mixed use by special permit only. So, um, and that doesn't have to be in an existing building. That can be new construction through special permit permitted as of right in our um, regional commercial, which is kind of our C3 district, which are pretty small and it's pretty, pretty small area in the city. Um, and then specially permitted in College Town Village um, because we didn't change the regulations for College Town Village at all. And they're specially permitted currently. Those are the only places in the city right now we're proposing to allow drive-through restaurants, specially permitted in FMU, permitted as of right in the RC zone and specially permitted in College Town Village District. All the rest of the districts in the city, they are prohibited. We're proposing that they be prohibited. So, um, and, and so Roseanne's showing you a map right now that 
shows where all the existing locations are for drive through So they would retain their built as status unless they burned to the ground. If they burned to the ground, they wouldn't be able to rebuild. But if they, if they just are between owners and they're abandoned for a while, they would retain their built as status. So that's what you, and there's 31 across the city total. And then so there's the, on, just on the outskirts. So the purple dots, let me move this out of the way. The purple dots are the existing ones. So we've got some here, some here, some here, a cluster here, up here. Um, the red dots are where they are on the outskirts of the city, of the city, so here. So, I mean, we do have uh, sort of different opinions on this. Um, you can see that there's a cluster right where we have none in the city and there's a cluster here right where we have none in the city. And so, um, uh, there is a, a concern that, you know, um, if you've got them where you've got them, uh, that's great. But for those neighbors, neighborhoods of the city that might want some, where they have to go to the outskirts of the city to access them. Uh, of course, COVID has changed everything as well. Um, and then there's also a, a large contingency that likes what we, we did and is happy to say, you know, we really don't want them in these districts. Now, just to remind you, the Brown, is the FMU. So the brown is where currently we allow it with a special permit. Well, we're proposing, and Roseanne. As our, that's what our draft currently proposes. And then the red areas, which are sort of here, is where we currently propose to allow them as of right. And then, of course, the village districts are the village districts. We haven't but, changed the codes for them. Yeah, it's just College Town Village that is allowing them and it's by special yeah. permit. And that, that's what you see down here, too. And if I could just add that um, the reason why we're showing the locations outside of the city, we wouldn't normally do that for this kind of analysis is um, not just to show, you know, whether or not they're in the city or not. It's more of the nature of a drive through is you're going to drive there. Right. So um, wanted to show the location of these businesses that are in relatively easy driving access. Um, in case there are concerns that people don't have enough access to drive through restaurants. Um, this would show that they have dozens and dozens of, of options for that. Yeah, I think um, if you talk to economic development, they, they would very much like some of those options to be in the city. But <laughs> again, we've got different sides on this issue. Um, but we are, we are following, um, or sort of where we are is, um, with allowing it in the NMU, and there's a decent amount of N NMU in the city, as you can see, I mean, FMU, sorry, in the city, as you can see the brown areas. Um, and with that, I, I guess we'd like to hear what you, you guys think. And maybe before that, I would just also like to bring up something that's sort of a new topic, which is the, um, not the drive-through, but the pickup only. Um, this is something that hasn't been built yet in the city, but we are seeing people coming in with requests for a zoning to sort of preview and how we would treat this. Um, uh, Chipotle and some other restaurants are looking to start doing this and it's the pickup only window. So um, there's no ordering, there's no paying, you're just driving up to the window and picking up your order. Um, and so that's kind of a new thing as well. And it's not addressed in our code at all. Right now, our definition for drive-through would include a pickup only window. And so, I guess we're looking for some guidance there of whether we not whether or not we need to open up that discussion, um, whether that's going to be a less intensive use uh, than a drive through. Um, I, I, I say leave it with drive throughs, <clears throat> make it just as difficult for those things. I agree, particularly because the the time frame that it takes you to go in just to pick up is so minimal that there's there's not much advantage to permitting that extra loophole for a pickup only window. There's an advantage to the business though, Kim. <laughs> right, I'll get right. that. But, yeah. but if we're thinking about the, the, the city residents or what yes. advantage we're giving them to like totally. get that, to facilitate that, it's it's minimal at best. It's, I, this might be in Irondequoit, but it's, um, it's up on Ridge. There's a Chick-fil-A that just went in and I drive by it every time I go to Home Depot. Um, and I don't know if they have order signs but there's no actual window either. The workers like come out, but it's this massively, and I don't care who designed it, it's ugly. <laughs> you drive by it and it's massive with this huge awning 
and people are just like running food out to the cars all day. And it just takes up. It's so much asphalt and it's sorry. I, you can are, tell how I feel. <laughs> are the, are the, are the staff on roller skates? <laughs> it would be mildly cooler if that were the case. <laughs> Um, we did, um, I also just want to reiterate that we did get a lot of comments that said, why are you allowing these in the FMU? Um, it, it, the comments have been all over the board, but, but a lot of comments are about not having drive throughs in the city. Comments being in favor of not having them in the, in the city or against or both ways? But both ways, both uh. ways. I, I didn't count, but I, I don't like to count because um, sometimes it, that doesn't really give a good indication. So, but we received a lot of comments about not having them at all. Some, a lot of comments about why aren't you letting this be specially permitted in MAU, NMU? And we had comments, about why are you allowing them in FMU? I mean, they're all, and then some were, you know, why, aren't, why don't we have them in more places in the city? I mean, just, just a range of comments all over the board. I don't know if this would impact your your views on this, but you know my my experience is with the zoning board of appeals, and I can tell you that we've had a couple of uh, variance applications to the board for um, drive through windows, and they are inevitably approved because they can establish that they would have an economic hardship that they cannot that their their business isn't financially viable without the drive through. And um, if they're reasonably well designed and they can, you know, and the site is designed so that it doesn't create huge impacts, the zoning board has typically approved them. Now, whether that speaks, you know, whether that convinces you that they're, you might as well allow them or whether you say, no, I'm still not going to let it happen well, the, and the, we'll make it go through a variance. But yeah, the, I mean, the know. bottom line is, is that just because it's prohibited doesn't mean it doesn't apply for a variance. And if it needs the variance, it does provide an opportunity for the community to weigh in on it. And it also provides an opportunity to apply Conditions. some mitigation measures to the drive-through um, if they in fact do have an economic hardship um, for that location. And they can only, you know, they can only achieve a reasonable rate of return for that property by putting in a drive-through restaurant. Mm -hmm. So, so prohibited doesn't mean absolutely no way it can never happen. It just means you need to go get a use variant. You know, go through the process. Yeah. Yeah. So jo Johanna, so that's um, they're doing that as use variances. Yeah. Wow. So that yeah, so you got to show like you can't make an economic return on any of the permitted as of right in the whole district, right? And yep. And these yeah national chains come well equipped with that information. I can assure you. <laughs> but isn't that like also as we talk about pickup only and the like increase of mobile ordering and apps like again the convenience of a drive-through and why people might go that like the difference between a drive-through and a mobile pickup order is a difference of like 90 seconds right yeah. like I, I just think that's a really hard argument to make that like certainly if I have to choose the if I have kids in the car and I've got to choose between a drive through and like going in and waiting for something, that's a meaningful difference. But if it's like jumping out, grabbing my Starbucks and getting back in the car, I, I don't know. I don't have kids. So I did not just admit to abandoning them in the car. Um, but <laughs> there is seconds. some Would impact. You know, one of the the, the um, issues that comes up is in the drive through is the order board, which has, um sound coming out of it and and light you know and that whether so that that is an impact that has to be addressed and that's often done in the in the if there is an approval though um and it's a little different than a drive up window where you're not going to have any um sound coming out of it or or light you know you're not gonna have a lit order board so there is a impact difference right i I agree with that. But less queuing that also it, because it takes less time. But the, the mitigation of the the of the effects of not having the drive through, the pickup the pickup option, the mobile ordering option mitigates to the restaurant the potential effect of us eliminating that mm. community nuisance. That's my point. Mm. I guess I have a question uh, when it comes to mitigation. 
when you're looking at drive-throughs, oftentimes the applicants will also want equal amount of parking. So they're not willing to give up parking in order to have a drive-through. Is that something that's been considered uh, uh, with the uh, with this app? Um, only in the in the sense that uh, again, getting rid of parking minimums, but as an actual sort of one for one trade off. Um, no, I mean, if that's what you're talking about, I mean, and truthfully, they're usually the ones who ask for even more parking. You know, it's not even just the main parking. They they always ask for more parking. So they got the drive through and the more parking, but. Well, all right. These drive throughs just create a lot more asphalt, whether a car is parked on it or not, you're making a lot more asphalt around the buildings. And I thought the goal was not to do that. But if you're going to pave it, I don't know, I'm, you know, make it parking, make it five minute parking, make it pickup spaces or something like that. Mm -hmm. rather than these these lanes of, of drive-through that are, you know, to me, you know, and again, you know, if you're talking about a walkable city, then why are you, why are you, why are you going to try to make it easy for people to sit in their cars and drive through instead of maybe get out of their car, walk into the store and back, and it's a start. I'm sort of arguing for Brad here, which is, I don't know, strange for me, but... <laughs> So <laughs> you, you said it, Steve. <laughs> so are, Richard, Richard, I'm sorry. All right. So are we, it, it sounds to me based on what I'm hearing from every, from people who've spoken is that you're okay with the very limited, um, very limited drive-throughs in the districts in the city. And if that's the case, um, I, I don't see us adding drive-throughs to the use table for for BMU or you know the boutique mixed use or the neighborhood mixed use. That's what I feel like I'm hearing from people. And my question would be then, do we do we continue to have it in the flexible mixed use as a special permit or do we take it out of that? I mean I think it, it's appropriate as a special permit as as you've as as you know currently suggested given the, the purpose of the flexible misuse is to, mixed use is to um, you know to find uses for these spaces that are hard to fill. Okay. So if that's one of them, um, and the special permit gives the opportunity for you know a site specific evaluation of you know the impacts, and you know there may be perfect locations and there may be lousy locations, and the commission then has a chance to consider those. Okay. Does everyone kind of agree with that? Yeah, up. To, but I, there's a there's a provision in there that if the place burns down, an existing one burns down, then it loses that right for a drive through. Did I hear yeah. that correctly? Is um, if it's so it's a um, Tom and Johanna help me out and Roseanne, but if it's a pre exist if it's a, if it has built as if it's a built as mm -hmm. uh, drive through, which means it's a non conforming structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It would have to burn beyond 75% um, for it not to be able to be replaced. If it burns up to 75%, it can be replaced. So I think that's the rule for a built as structure. So what if somebody comes along and just wants to knock it down and build another one completely on their own for their own style, their own with a drive through? They cannot. Okay. Good. If they if they destroy it beyond 75%. Mm -hmm then it has to be rebuilt with something that's conforming, which would be no drive-through. Okay, so sounds like we're, we've got a strong consensus on this one. Is there anyone who disagrees? Okay. All right, we're gonna move on to the next. So the next one is a pretty broad topic. It's uh, climate resiliency. It's also one of those topics where we can get sort of contradicting in interests because there are many aspects to climate resiliency. But we do in the new code um, try to uh, strike a balance and promote more climate resiliency. Um, we gave you a bunch of information there and we had a series of, of general questions as we get into the, the details of the code. Um, 
the first one was to what extent should provisions require e-bike charging stations and indoor bike storage, uh, particularly on multifamily. Um, you know, if you have something with say 80 units, do you require um, a bike a bike storage space for each unit is a percentage of units and how much of that should be indoors because that's another piece is providing the, the bike storage indoors. Um, and then e-bike charging stations, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of car e-charging stations um, and we are requiring some car e-charging stations. Um, do we need to do the same for e-bike charging? Typically, codes uh, do very well when they do percentages instead of numbers, like, you know, one fourth, you know, half of the units or something like that. Maybe that's an option that you guys can explore and, and see the out of 80 units, as you said, what is the percentage that, that they need to comply with, with the code? My opinion. Okay. So, do you, so um, in that case, um, how does the group feel about 80% um, of bicycle parking? Let's see, what are uh, probably one space, one bicycle space? What's your thoughts on an apartment building having to require one bicycle parking space for every unit proposed? That's one space for every unit with 80% of those spaces protected from the weather. Do you think that's reasonable? Or do you, do you have an opinion on where we should go with that? And that's number two, by the way. We're not talking about number one right now. We were talking about number two. Years ago, a colleague of mine in New York was doing some survey of housing. And they were able to get into these rental units and do their survey and they walked into one and there was a motorcycle because the guy wasn't gonna leave his motorcycle parked out where it could get ripped off. So I'm, I'm not sure about, you know, having bike parking, a lot of bike parking unsecured. Okay. Do you think, so I think that goes to the 80% then is what I think I'm hearing you saying that 80% is okay. Um, I, I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I think that's what you're saying that it should be a high number of protected spaces. Otherwise people won't use them. They'll put them in their apartments. Um, you're, yeah, if, yeah, if protected means, means secured. Yeah, um, it just means I've got a roof over it. It's oh, wide open, that's okay. different. Okay. What about the one per one unit, uh, Commissioner Picardo? It sounded like you were thinking that it wouldn't necessarily be one for one, but more of a percentage of the number of units. And only because code like to uh, perform very well when you do net and gross and a percentage of that amount, mm -hmm. then it, it's easy to, to do that calculation because if you do it by units, there could be units. Uh, it's, it's very specific to, to um, or use of, of, you know, so that's what we think. Maybe have the space and a certain percentage needs to be the percentage of everyone having a bike. We would love to, I, I wish, but is that reality? Maybe, I don't know. It's not something that's, a, but until I live in an apartment and I, I see bikes, uh, I see maybe 10, 20 bikes at the most. Um, if the, you know, we're preparing for the future, it's not gonna be much to just set 100% of the units, so one unit per, maybe we should do that. It, I guess it's more open for discussion in the sense of maybe uh, the, the um, staff will do a little more of, of research or maybe see how all the cities are doing it and how is it working. Maybe. Yeah. This, this is what was uh, recommended to us by our consultant who works in other cities. And, and maybe the, the idea is, is that some, some apartments are going to want to have a bike for every member of the family, and some apartments will have none. So by doing one per unit, it gives that opportunity to be flexible in who's using bikes and who's not. That is perfect. That is a perfect explanation. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. That, okay. that makes a lot of sense. I, I, it also, I don't... I don't know, one per unit feels like a lot, even though that's where we want the city to go. It feels a little bit like if we're successful, like 
requiring them to have bike parking doesn't mean, or bike storage doesn't mean that that's going to get used. And if we are able to facilitate a city that promotes biking, then the demand by the residents will drive that as opposed to just this requirement that we don't really know is going to, like we can put all the bike storage we want, but if people don't have bikes to put there, that doesn't make sense. And one for each unit feels like a lot. Okay. Yep. Okay. I hate to say it, but it's just sort of like maybe Brad's argument too, which is, you know, it's certainly, you know, having over, over prescribing car parking, you know, is an issue, but it's not as bad an impact if you're over, over prescribing bike parking. It doesn't take as big a footprint. But it's also it's also easier to put in on the back end. Like it's hard to put in a parking lot where you haven't reserved the space, whereas putting in a bike rack is a lot easier. Well, it's a smaller footprint, yeah. Well, but keep in mind too what we're uh, if if you're doing eighty percent of secured, then that's either in the building or has some sort of it's not just a bike rack, right? Does staff have any statistics um, on average uh, multi-unit? housing developments that have been built in the last five to 10 years? Like what are we seeing in terms of size of development these days? I was gonna ask that question. I do not have any statistics on that. It's, it's very, it varies. I mean, it-, it just, just looking for, I mean, we're not seeing 500 unit builds mostly. I mean, you might see a lot of like, I've seen a lot of 30, 40s, I think recently maybe some 50s, it's a lot of 99s, like all of Union is like 99 units. Um, you know, Sibley was 280. And so I've been like, I, my mind jumped to Sibley and being like 280 bike parking spaces, like, oh my yeah, goodness. It, it yeah, that's a, a lot. that's a good point. I mean, and we have some of our affordable housing that's been going up that has a hundred plus units in right. that right. home. And, and, yeah. And maybe if there's a way that uh, it could be somewhat of a, um, uh, research where maybe the city contacts some developers and see how 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 many um, bike uh, is, are people asking for it? How many are they using out of the out of they have? I mean, I don't know if that's the city's job to do, but it would be nice to, or even through a third party, to kind of have a, a statistics because it's very hard to make a decision on a concept. Conceptually, we want this to be a city where a lot of people bike. But it's really a concept. Tomorrow things could change and, and, and a lot of things could happen. I wonder how much we can learn because there's probably bicycles right now that are just being stored in people's apartments right. or in their storage units. So I don't know that we would necessarily, that the property owner would know. True. They might, they might have a sense of it. I mean, we could, we could ask, um, but you know, it, it it's it, there's so many variables and whether it's a downtown apartment like Sibley's versus some of the the housing development we're seeing the large scale housing development we're seeing in other parts of the city like in you know in the northeast I I don't know and for I don't those, know if the data is going to give you clear direction but for those reasons it's hard then to, to come up with an arbitrary number yeah. of it is so, hard. I agree. That's why we have a question here because we're kind of looking for direction mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> so I think one thing we could put together potentially is just kind of come up with a like a small, medium, and large size uh, development and just at least give you an idea of what kind of footprint this would take up if we went this way to give you an idea of you know the sort of spatial impact. That's something we could do. Um, that's a possibility. And of course, um, we, I'm, I'm just wondering where we could get some statistics from. I'm not, I'm not sure. And Roseanne, um, you're could... not, you're, are you saying, um, sorry, if I misread this, this doesn't have to be necessarily putting my development hat on, does this have to be like offered for free or like, cause it's also another thing that like, if I'm a developer that's creating a space and now I have to carve out a lot of square footage for bike stuff that, that exactly. could be rentable square footage, or I charge 10 bucks a month per space for people to store their bikes there. Exactly. So I could at least give you um, the sort of square footage that this is going to take up to see just what kind of an impact this would be from 
a development point of view. And, and you know, maybe it's one of those things where we come up with um, something that's more like a minimum. And uh, as Commissioner Harding said, let the market drive the increase to that, um, perhaps. So something that's just like a reasonable bare minimum that everyone should have in their development and let the market drive beyond that. It's, it's a real tough one. Yeah, we, we, we'll, ha we'll have to see if we can collect some data. And then um, I, I like Roseanne, I like that idea of maybe creating like a small, medium and large percentage. Um, so we could probably call a couple of developers um, and, and see what, you know, what they think. All right. So I would want that to be our only source of, of data, however, because that might not be the best. No, I was going to say that again. <laughs> they, 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 no, no bike. I know. I know. We got to be careful. Yeah. It's more of well, a question of how many people have been asking for it or, or on your building, how many bikes do you have? I think it's more than the question of, of what do you have now? then what do you want for the future? Because if you want for the future, then it's gonna take you off. And I think we can also rely on our consultant uh, for work they may have done in other uh, mm. Northeast cities. I mean, they were the consultant for the Buffalo's green green plant, green, what was it called? The green? The green code. The green code, thank you, oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, we could you know, ask them what they did with Buffalo and, and, um, and get some ideas that way too. Yeah. Okay, um, and the e-bike charging, is that something that should be market driven or should we, uh, yeah, I'm getting a, a nod from uh, the chair. Market driven on the e-bike charging. Okay. Okay, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about lot coverage. Um, what we call lot coverage now, we're actually um, sort of dividing into two numbers, one is impervious surface coverage, and one is just building coverage. Um, and when we look at impervious surface coverage, which includes the house, the porch, the garage, any pavement, um, what we are proposing to do is increase that number to 60% from 50%, but remove all of the exemptions for the 144 square foot sheds, which if, raise your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about, because I can explain it. Does everybody know the 144 foot shed exemption that we have where we, we don't count it when we do? So in the current code, um, if you have a shed that's 144 square feet or less, when we calculate your lot coverage, that's exempt. We don't count it. I don't know where it came from, but it's in the code. Um, Roseanne, didn't you also do an analysis of what actually is happening in the city, where, what typical lots have? So, so the 144 when, square feet just just that came from the fact that they don't need a building permit. Ah, so yes. we, okay, that's why we did we did that. So what I did was I took um, a series of and I'll just give you a real quick preview of this. I took a series of uh, site site plans for uh, the typical 40 by 100 square foot Rochester lot. So I'll just so, so here's I went through a bunch of these. I'm just going to flash through them. Um, your typical lots that we have here in Rochester. And I did some calculations. And uh, I discovered that invariably, um, if you have 50% uh, lot coverage, you do not have a garage. You have a house, you have a driveway. Um, if you throw in a garage, you're, you're somewhere between uh, 54 to 62%. Um, so the idea was, uh, we struggle with this a lot in the zoning office where people come in and they want to, um, you know, put a small addition on or put a garage on and they immediately have to go for a variance because they, they're they over lot coverage. And the thought was we should really have a code that lets at least the standard Rochester house site, 40 by 100 feet, have a house, a front porch, because we like porches, um, a driveway and a garage. And it, from, from the data that I've accumulated, that is 60% lot coverage. And so we propose to, to change it to 60%, but also eliminate all the, the, the exemption for 144 square feet. So we'll count everything. Um, and so, so, yep. So the reason that it's here, this question is because 
for sustainability reasons, we and our our you know according to our climate action plan and our um, climate climate mitigation whatever they call what it, what it's called here um, the climate vulnerability assessment um, our vulnerability for climate change is 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 these is stormwater right it's these big storms that we have and we get this flood of water and our sea, our sewer systems cannot handle all of this additional water it's it's not it's not designed for this climate change impact so it seems counterintuitive to increase the lot coverage allowance when you're trying to have more stormwater management on site so i i it's kind of this so in the in you know, trying to accommodate a normal city development while we're also trying to accommodate stormwater, on-site stormwater management um, has made us, it put us in a tough position. So um, we just kind of want to share that, that problem with you and see if you can, you know, do you agree we should, should take the lot coverage to 60% to save people from variances for a normal city development or should we keep it 50% and kind of force people to keep a lot of green space on their property to accommodate stormwater? So this is the this is the um, the debate that we're looking to you to help us with. So it's the decreasing nonconformities versus um, you know adding green space, and this is just residential uses. Um, we do not have any um, coverage requirements for commercial districts, commercial uses. Yes. Um, I, actually, I'm, I'm thinking that the, there's a typo in here for stormwater management. You're talking residential maximum lot coverage, not minimal lot coverage, aren't you? Yes, maximum. Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. Yeah. We, th is that in the code? Because we caught that with the consultant. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. I thought I was reading there. Okay. So you want to go to 60%, to which, you know, I mean, it's an urban type of thing situation. So. I oh, you're right. That. I'm sorry. In the report, it also says mi minimal because yeah. we corrected also in the code. They they had made that. Okay, I'm correcting yeah. now. Okay, I, that's why I was I was scratching my head on that. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. So, all right. So, fifty six percent. Well, uh, what about permeable pavements? I mean, well, you know, it seems to me there could be a trade off there. That that if you you know that if you've got if you if you want to put in a garage and the porch and you know the house and all that and it comes to 70 percent but you've got this ass well total but you've got this asphalt pavement you're going to replace with a permeable pavement maybe you've got some trade-off there that would certainly come into play when someone's going for a variance for lot coverage i think there's yeah. a, a, a go ahead Sorry. no i i think 60 percent you know recognizing um you know, the typical uh, residential lot makes sense. I think uh, getting rid of a bunch of nonconformities and having to deal with those, I mean, those are not a great use of, of you know, staff and city resources to deal with nonconformities where the argument is, I'm just like everyone else, you know, and I, I think 60% is reasonable. Um, I think permeable, permeable pavement for a, you know, single family or two family might be a bit, a bit of a, a hard sell. Um, certainly when you get into commercial or multifamily, definitely can talk about that. But maybe there are other other strategies that that a homeowner, you know, can consider um, where where the, the rain coming off the roof doesn't necessarily have to go to the sewer system or to the driveway. Maybe there's a you know, maybe there's an in-between that can help help with that. But but I don't like the idea of every time someone wants to put on a little bump out that it causes a lot of uh or put up a garage that maybe was there at one point or yeah be, so does there. everyone agree with 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 uh commissioner repholtz about um the 60 percent is really makes the most sense again residential lots residential lots about. okay okay um so, the, the, so what, you, what you were talking about commissioner is um kind of what we're talking about in number four 
is what other strategies might people be able to use? Um, and are these things we should be considering requiring them or, you know, rain barrels, rain gardens, that kind of thing? Or are these just strategies that we have to impose for people who are coming in for a variance from the 60%? It sounds like a good strategy for people that are looking for a variance. You know, it's, it's mitigation. Um, and it, it seems to be the kind of thing that, you know, the more people learn about and how easy they are, the more they would might, you know, grab that, all that water that's coming off their garage and put it in a rain barrel or a rain garden of some kind. Um, what about um, number five, porous pavement? Um, you know, one thing in terms of man mandating porous pavement you know, is that something we should consider maybe mandating whenever anybody uh, is approved for parking over the required minimum um, so that, you know, you get that extra parking, but you've got to do it with porous pavement or, I mean, are there other situations where, where maybe we should start mandating that? Or is that just something that's too, too much of a detail that we really shouldn't be um, Porous pavement needs to be engineered, you know, with the, the subsurface, and there may be other ways to divert that rainwater to a rain garden or a rain, you know, some kind of on-site detention that doesn't mandate porous pavement. Um, so porous pavement sounds very specific to me, whereas, you know, stormwater mitigation of some appropriate kind, you know, I could imagine rather than directing, you know, the pavement to the street, it directs it to a you know, that lovely rain garden that, mm -hmm. uh, that does the same thing as porous pavement, but doesn't require excavating two to three feet of, you know, on-site material to create that infrastructure. So it sounds like these are all possible mitigations and more appropriately considered when someone's there for a special permit uh, for excessive parking or a variance, but nothing that we should start to, to sort of mandate in, in any level. Okay. Uh, I guess for me, just mandating any one particular engineering solution yeah. feels different than, um, you know, describing the outcome you're looking for and let, let the right solution for that particular site, you know, be brought forward. So porous pavement seems very specific and has, um, you know, advantages and disadvantages that other mitigation that achieves the same outcome, you know, might, might be more appropriate. Okay. Okay. Is everyone agreeing? I'm there? seeing a lot of nods. Yes. Anybody disagree? Okay. 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 Um, should non residential uses in residential districts be denied any increase in their lot coverage? Um, so this is talking about, um, you know, the, the, the store. The non-residential use that's um, in the middle of a residential district, and they want to increase. I, I'm not sure exactly where this one's coming from, Jermaine. So I so I can help you out. So what yeah. this is is, um, you know, we're giving a lot of um, new benefits to pre-existing non-residential uses in residential districts in terms of their use, but. If, a, if a, an existing building, an, an existing non-residential building has a use going into it, they may all of a sudden think they can also put up, you know, a new driveway and maybe some parking and some other things that, um, that would increase their lot coverage. And it's not, this is not just about stormwater. It's also about intensity of the use on the site. So in this particular situation, because we have this new allowance for more uses in these types of buildings, should we not allow them to increase their lot coverage or should we allow them to increase their lot coverage to a certain degree? Or is there anybody, do you have any strong feeling about this or should we just kind of let, I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'm looking, we're looking for direction on this, what you guys think. It's not an easy one. Yeah, to me, a, yeah, to me this feels, yeah, feels like an it depends answer. You know, you want to look at the site, you want to look at the circumstances and what it is they're proposing. Um, you know, if it's a, 
a generous sidewalk or, you know, I, I can imagine um, proposals where you look at it and say, that's a good idea. And other proposals where you look at it and say, that's not a good idea. So if there was some way to okay. not, not permit it or deny it, you know, right out of pocket, but require some degree of discretionary review. Okay. I don't know what that well, would be if it's site plan review or, uh, um, or an area variance. I mean, that would be where you you weigh the benefits to the owner and the detriment to the neighborhood. And you you look at that and you can impose conditions and grant lesser relief. So that's a whole area variance. Um, you know, that, that's that's the way that could be handled. OK. If that, and if that is was the way, then we would prohibit it so that they would have to go for a variance um, to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do people feel about that? Got some nods. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Flower looks like he's thinking, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Would there be any additional criteria you'd want to add to consideration of area variance in those instances? Like, I, I don't think so. I think they're 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 just the right questions you want to ask, right? Um, like, I'm thinking. Well, they could give you the mitigation measures themselves, but I guess like whether you'd want to have a menu of possible ones or, but I guess good engineers, the applicants will figure that out anyway. Yeah. Of course, many of these small non-conforming sites don't necessarily have an engineer on board, but um, certainly uh, it's a good question, but We'd, we'd have to explore that when we when we require the area variance. There might be something in there we can we can include. We'll have to look at that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, this was brought to our attention. Um, should so we we have these ancillary parking lots all the time, and the question was raised: Should lot coverage regulations for parking lots be more restrictive? Uh, in other words, instead of allowing 65% um, of the lots it should be 60%, that should 60%, be 60%, 60% of the lots be covered, only allow parking lots 50%. Oh, getting a big thumbs up from at least one of you. But this would this would sort of take into account that, that um, these are, you know, you're putting a use on the site, which is predominantly paving. And so therefore you want to um, give them a little less coverage than you would. Um, <clears throat> And, and then more, if, more nods now. And if they wanted to go higher than 50% through the area variance process, they would have to Im, have to um, provide uh, mitigation such as rain gardens or um, permeable. Screening, landscaping. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. And um, the, the planning commission runs into this somewhat with parking lots because parking lot related rules about aisle widths and things like that, they, they can waive standards as part of approving a special permit for an ancillary parking lot. We ran into a situation just last month <coughs> where we realized uh, that we wanted to be able to have the planning commission waive other things like um, setbacks. Mm -hmm. So, so Tom, that makes sense because the parking lots in the residential districts are all specially permitted. So we could add this as a uh, use standard and then it's waivable by the planning commission. So in, I can, Including the lot coverage. Yeah, I yeah, think that was I, our problem. That lot yeah. coverage, there wasn't that in 173 of the zoning code like the regards parking lots. So we weren't allowed to like, uh, waive the planning commission wasn't allowed to waive lot coverage. All right, so then I think we'd want to keep it that way. I think we'd want to yeah. keep it that way. I think we okay. want to allow them to waive, um, for instance, the drive aisle or something to get to that 50%. Um, and then, um, if they want to exceed the lot coverage, then I would make them go for a variance. That's okay, that. how do you guys feel about that? Yes, I'm getting okay. lots of nods. Okay. Yeah, and um, it, in, in that aspect, maybe the decrease of coverage from 60 to 50%, you know, allows for a more um, 
you know, targeted review of those mitigation measures and the, the need, you know, the, the economic mm-hmm. need um, for that additional parking. So I, I would not object. I, I, you know, I would be okay leaving it at 60, but I wouldn't object to reducing it to 50 in residential, those residential ancillary lots. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just just say- the way it was presented to me was the people were kind of put out because I, I thought there was like a, you're trying to discourage ha- having, having applicants to go to multiple boards. Um, but I, I, I just raised that you kind of devil's advocate because that was presented to me. Like, why do we now have to go to the zoning mm-hmm. board when we went for our ancillary parking lot to special permit and they're looking at these exact same issues, you know? Yeah. Well, I can see that, but sorry. No, I was just saying it's a good point. It is a good point, but at the same time, I, I think there is a line where you're just making it too easy because now they can get everything they want by going to the CPC or to the zoning board. Um, when, and and so it kind of dilutes the fact that they're actually looking for these waivers and these variances. So for me, it's a bit muddy. It's a a bit muddy. Yeah. That's, that's a good point too. Like the, the planning commission with special permits, they can't look at like hardship and, and, uh, balancing the variance. They're, they're not used to that. That's what the zoning board suited for. Um, and so if you want those things factored in, it is better that they go for those types of waivers of variances to the zoning board. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and I'm just going to, Commissioner Picardo and, and Harding, just let me know if you disagree because I don't see you. So I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads, but, but not yours. So you can just let me know if you disagree. I'm hearing. I'm good. I'm just going to get a charger. My my, I want to get a charger. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. I, um, I agree too. Although I, my Zoom cut out in the middle, so I missed it was a portion of what Tom was saying and I had to pop back in. So everything I heard sounded good. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. So we did that one. Uh, so number eight, should there be lot coverage requirements in non-residential districts? We currently don't have any and we don't propose any, but is that something we should be considering um, given, given climate change? Well, I think, um, I mean, lot coverage isn't the only way to mitigate stormwater. And um, what, what are the other, um, uh, you know, uh, reviews or agencies that that have it, uh, you know, review over the stormwater. I, I think much of our city, the stormwater ends up in the combined sewer, so the the management is really a quantity management, right, rather than a qualitative uh, improvement yes. of the stormwater. But maybe we need to move towards that. Maybe at some point we need to be looking for, you know, that infrastructure, that aged infrastructure, to be improved such that you know, more site level stormwater management, although these are smaller sites, so it's, it's hard to hard to say, but it, it feels like um, it, paving is not the only, or, or lot coverage is not the only way to address stormwater, right? right? Yes. Um, and, and to start to, to use that in commercial areas, I don't think, you know, is gonna get us there. And it may have a dampening effect on what people do with those commercial lots that we want to be beneficially used. So I don't know. Does zoning get into stormwater management? It's really other, other no, aspects it's really, of it's review, really right? Other, yes, it really is other aspects of review. Um, I mean, to the extent that um, there are certain sizes, and if you get to a certain size, you're, you know, the zoning code does say you're required to have a catch basin, but you know, where that goes in the design of it, that all goes to somebody else. So there's a little bit of overlap, but very little bit. Um, and you're right. I mean, um, it has to do with like, um, you know, what's the quantity of water going to be used? I mean, is this a huge warehouse or is this uh, 80 units, you know, uh, um, mixed use with um, 80 bathrooms and showers and whatnot. And, it's, and for big, a lot of factors. For big uh, big developments or large parking lots with with catch basins, we would rely on the county to 
advise on that and review the plans and so forth. And isn't that also part of the seeker process that they look at those kinds of issues prior to, prior to getting yeah. to us? Yes, it is part of the seeker process. Yeah, if, if it's, a, if it's an, yeah, if it's unlisted, um, it would be, if it's a type two, we wouldn't look at it. And um, yeah, it would be, it would have to be a very large project for stormwater to become an issue and for the seeker process. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not feeling any really desire to get into um, coverage requirements for commercial districts, mixed use, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if, the issue, if the issue is climate, you know, mitigation, I don't know that that's the place to do it. I think the place to do it is, you know, probably in concert with the county and an understanding of our yes. you know, combined sewer system and what we can do to really address that, if anything. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the last one, um, urban farms uh, are allowed season lengthening facilities such as high tunnels and hoop houses. Uh, the same provision was not included for community gardens, which was a concern expressed in comments. Um, should this provision be added? Does everybody know what I mean with um, high tunnels and hoop houses and that kind of season lengthening stuff? Yeah, no? Okay, so you, you've got um, certain uh, plants that you're planting and over the winter, you put this sort of curved shelter over it. It's like the structure, um, it's covered. So it helps keep the heat, the heat in and contain them during the summer. Um, hoop houses are, I mean, they're kind of like what they sound like. They're just big structures made of hoops. Um, and uh, we, the thing is with the, with the gardens and the urban farming, you know, the planting can be anywhere on the site. And so you might end up with these um, anywhere on the site. Um, and uh, community gardens is more of a small scale thing. Community gardens are allowed in residential districts. Um, so we, we left these out of that, um, but um, it's something we could add to that to, to promote these. It's kind of like when you see the bushes wrapped with the burlap sacks, it's just on a slightly bigger scale and with some, some rigid structure to it. Um, I mean, I, well, hoop, I have to admit a hoop house is, is the hoops and surface, plastic, though, right? <laughs> Whoop. Say that. Sorry. That, was, that was a couple of people at once. So I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> no, I would, this is uh, Steve Rebel. I was just going to say a hoop house is, is, you know, the hoops with the plastic, as I understand it. So it's like a, a temporary greenhouse. Yeah. And, um, you know, in a community garden, I would just want to see there's some kind of a commitment to maintaining it because it is a temporary in nature and can get destroyed over time. Um, but I hadn't thought about the fact that it's now an impervious surface, but it's an impervious surface in a garden. So they've got lots of uses for the water that runs off yeah. of it. And only for part of the year. So it's not permanent. Are they typically taken down, Roseanne, during the summer months? Uh, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to claim vast knowledge of this. I am not a community <laughs> gardener, but I do believe that this is uh, this is temporary for the winter months to keep them healthy, um, to shield them from the wind uh, and the frost, because it does make sort of a mini greenhouse, so it keeps them warm. Is is the concern that uh, somebody who's doing an urban farm is going to actually actively maintain things, but a community garden that may not happen? I, I think the concern was scale, um, that an urban farm is, is a larger, it, it's likely to be a larger area. And um, so it's more, and, it's more of a commercial operation, whereas a community garden is, is meant to be a smaller scale um, operation. And so we were just thinking in terms of intensity of use and scale. And, yeah. And and urban farms are only allowed in the residential districts with a special permit, whereas community gardens are allowed. So they're smaller and they're allowed. Um, so knowing that the urban farm in a residential district is gonna get some oversight, some look, some, some a hard look at it, 
but not necessarily the community garden. And we are allowing the, so right now the, the, the code is allowing both of these facilities to have sales on the site. Um, I don't think we do that. I don't think we do that. Now we don't have much about this at, at these uses at all in the current code, um, but we are both, both would be able to sell product uh, on site. So maybe we were hoping that maybe someone had, um, you know, you know, personal knowledge of this, these things and what, how they might translate in an urban environment for a community garden. Um, so that's why we were kind of asking, but if, if you don't, that's fine. You can. Like, uh, I guess I'll just add, sorry, um, that, you know, if my, my initial concern was, is it going to be maintained? That's really a you know, property maintenance code enforcement issue, you know, should they be allowed in terms of, you know, their impact at a small scale that extends the use and allows the community gardens to thrive uh, more months of the year and, and enrich the community, I think that's probably a good thing. And let the maintenance really be addressed through other, other means rather than not allowing them. Should there be any size restrictions? Well, my experience with the community garden near me is that it looks like there's just individual plots of maybe 10 by 10, 10 by 20 feet or something that each individual person is responsible for. And um, as I've walked through it over the course of the year, some people seem to maintain theirs or had picked theirs and other people didn't seem to do anything. So you know, there's a lot of people responsible in a community garden and they all need to be responsible in order to not have a problem of, of whatever blowing plastic all over the place. That's my take on it. Whereas I'm thinking an urban farm is something where there's really one person who's ultimately responsible for it. Am I wrong on that? I, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> We're still we're still working out what an urban farm is, um, um, I because because I think some urban farms will be cooperative, so I don't know that it's going to always be one person. But it sounds like everybody's somewhat comfortable with with some of these being used. It's mostly uh, an ongoing question of of maintenance and. Um, not just with not just with these particular things, but with the whole maintenance of the community garden itself, um, picking up the trash, making sure things aren't being left unattended, and um, uh, you know weeds going rampant and just not taking care of your space. Um, but you might have in general, is everybody pretty um, comfortable with allowing season lengthening facilities in community gardens? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I do think the point about how big, I mean, I guess if you took an entire 40 by 100 lot and put a huge hoop house on it, that would be remarkable in a neighborhood. These are residential residential zoned community gardens, right? We're talking yeah. about. Yes. So maybe there is a question of what that coverage or scale should be height and coverage maybe. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Has, has the urban farm idea come from like residents of the city who have a definite idea they want to do it or from our consultants or a mixture of the... That's, that's a good question, Tom, because um, we're in very interesting times where we are in a housing crisis. So what determines is that this is going to be used for a housing farm or maybe for residential use, especially if we're trying to, if it's going to be used on the empty lots in different places in the city. Wow. Who's, is it, you know, um, just something to consider, take a consider, you know, because um, they, they go against one another. We're trying to resolve the housing crisis and trying to develop in, in the inner city specifically, but we're also promoting uh, using some of these spaces for community gardening. I, I think we're still... I, I think we're still sort of figuring out what the urban farm is. 
Um, and in part, that's because we're also trying to reconcile um, chapter 39 and all the, the sort of um, animal related codes that we that ZAP has no control over. Um, but I think there is a strong um, group, at least one strong group, maybe more in the city who would really like to see this happen. We may be back here to talk about urban forms uh, with more specificity once we've um, gotten ourselves sort of situated in terms of how we relate to chapter 39 and um, uh, some other things that uh, indirectly affect the urban farm. Um, you know, we need to talk to the police department because they issued the licenses, um, things like that. So um, we will probably be back here to talk about urban farms in more detail at some point. I think that's fair to say. Uh, guys. We're gonna have a wonderful description discussion about chickens and bees and, and well, cows God. and goats. We, we'll have mm -hmm. this all figured out soon. <laughs> I, I recommend that you leave it to the police or, or to Chris Fitzgerald or whatever, because oh. that is the biggest headache, that stuff. <laughs> no yeah, roosters. No roosters. Regulated the zoning code. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, well, we got a very exciting topic next. Oh, yes. Next is short-term whole dwelling unit rental. Um, so um, this is the one that is uh, meant to take care of these sort of short-term rentals um, that are happening in places. And um, what we have done recently is we looked at our definitions of uh, bed and breakfast, hotel, um, this definition, short-term, short we're gonna have to get an acronym for it. Short-term <laughs> short whole dwelling unit rental. Um, and we, so, we sort of took a close look to make sure that we were not, that there were clear distinctions between them and that we were not, um, that we were putting the, sort of the right uses in the right places. So currently we do not permit short-term whole dwelling unit rentals in LDR and MDR. They're first allowed in HDR. Um, I think it's fair to say, and, and Doreen and Kevin, you can correct me or Johanna, that we have as many people opposed to, to us not letting them in there as people who are happy we're not letting them in there. No, um, I think there's more people that don't want them than want them. But I think there's, okay. there's definitely on both sides, but we did hear a lot of, um, and, and Roseanne, can I just clarify that when you say sure. currently, you mean currently proposed, not in the current regulations, because we do not yes. regulate them in the current regulations. Yes. Currently, there is no regulation of these in our in our zoning code. They're, they're not a recognized use, and we have no uh, criteria for approving them. Um, but in the new code, we are going to try. So what we did was we, we modified the definitions to try to make things more clear. And I think I'm going to share and show that. I, did we send those definitions? I don't, I'm not sure that we did. Where's the? No, we didn't. Okay. We didn't, so we're gonna, we didn't send any changes. No. So we'll take a quick look at that. So, um, and I'll make this a little bigger. That's not working. Why won't you go bigger? Oh, here we go. Oh, that's too much. All right, so short-term whole dwelling unit rental is the rental of a whole dwelling unit to guests for periods of less than 31 consecutive days where the property owner or leaseholder does not reside within the dwelling unit. Any multifamily dwelling or mixed-use development where 50% or more of the dwelling units are short-term whole dwelling unit rentals is considered a hotel. Um, and and I want to, I'd like to clarify, Roseanne, that this is a change from what the community has seen already. We did, we did work based on comment because we heard comment that we couldn't distinguish these very easily. We've worked on the definitions to make them more distinctive. So what you're reading is not anything you've read before. And let's see, hotel, I'm going a little backwards here, but hotel is now a facility that provides sleeping accommodations and customary lodging services to guests for a fee. Related accessory uses may include, but are not limited to meeting facilities, restaurants, bars, fitness rooms, and recreational facilities for the use of guests. Hotels shall have a 24 hour on-site manager. Hotel does not include a motor lodge, short-term whole dwelling unit rental or bed and breakfast. 
Uh, for bed and breakfast, we have an owner-occupied and owner-operated dwelling unit originally designed as a residential structure where only bedrooms are used for providing overnight accommodations for less than 31 consecutive days at a time. And at minimum, a morning meal is provided. The dwelling unit is the owner's primary residence and at least one bedroom within the unit is reserved for the owner's exclusive personal use. And then the last definition that was tweaked was boarding house, um, a dwelling that offers lodging for 31 consecutive days or more within sleeping units for compensation with or without meals and not occupied as a single family dwelling. Individual sleeping units are let by the owner or operator to non-family members. This includes dormitories and fraternity and sorority houses. Boarding house, house does not include owner-occupied premises with sleeping units rented to two or fewer non-family members. So that was a lot. <laughs> um, and the, the primarily, primarily driving this was to clarify hotel versus short-term whole dwelling unit rental, where we got a lot of questions about um, the lack of difference or, or the perceived lack of difference between the two or confusion about the two. Um, part, of, part of what was driving it is the idea that, um, well, what if my whole dwelling unit is an apartment? And then if we have an apartment building where all the units are being rented um, out, you know, is that really now what makes that difference than a hotel? So we tried to, to clarify and use some thresholds that helped clarify that. Um, so I think first, are there qu are any questions from the board on on what we've done with the definition. So can I'd like to say one more thing, Roseanne. Mm -hmm. um, when we we came, when, one of the very early meetings with the um, commission, we did talk about combining the definition of short-term whole dwelling unit rental as a hotel, um, you know, in the definition of hotel. So basically if it's a, if it's a house that's being rented out like a hotel, um, it is a hotel and we were going to combine them and you guys thought that was fine. Um, and then our consultant came on board and said that you probably let, let's not do that because it gives us more flexibility of where we can allow them and what we, how we can regulate them as separate uses because they do look different than each other generally, not always, but anyway, so the, you know, there's always the option of just calling it a hotel. Um, which is what, how we started out with this way. So I just want to give you just, we talked about this with you guys and we, in case you guys are remembering that and it's confusing you, it was our consultant that really brought out that we should separate it from hotel. Well, I, I think there's concerns about people renting Airbnbs and, and just throwing wild parties and they don't care. They don't live there really, you know? And, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's very disruptive to the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, that's like people behaving more like they're in a hotel than if, if they're in a bed and breakfast, I think. Because a bed and breakfast, you do have the owner of the property on the property. So I wonder if, there should be some distinction made between somebody that owns a two unit, a double, and they want to rent out one as an Airbnb and live in the other one versus somebody that's bought up a whole bunch of houses and is running some big Airbnb business. That's a fair point, Commissioner. I do think we do make uh, some distinction. It may not be enough, but um, bed and breakfasts are permitted in LDR and MDR, um, short-term whole unit, short-term whole dwelling unit rental is not. It's not permitted until you get to HDR. Um, and we classify short-term uh, whole dwelling unit rental as a commercial use, whereas bed and breakfast is a residential use. Um, I, I, again, I don't know that that's enough, but there, there is that distinction currently. Wanted to clarify, um, one situation uh, the commissioner just mentioned, and, and my team can correct me if I have this wrong, because I've been really trying to uh, understand this more clearly. But in the situation where you, there's a double and the owner lives in one side and rents out the other side in an Airbnb fashion, as opposed to a traditional 
um, tenant situation. If the owner is there, that is considered both a two family and the there's a use presence, uh, present of a um, short term hold dwelling unit. So both uses are present in that situation. Um, and then you have to look at the use table to see which ones are allowed where. Wouldn't it not be a sh short term because the owner resides there? But he's right. He's residing in a separate unit. Oh, so this he's was, at the this dwelling, was, but not in yeah. that particular unit. Right. So this would still be a separate dwelling unit that was being rented. So if it was less than 31 consecutive days, it would be a short term whole dwelling unit rental. If it was more than that, it would just be a month to month rental, which we do have, which is um, something that we do get in the city. So then does the definition of bed and breakfast establishment need to be changed to an owner occupied and owner operated dwelling? No, it's a dwelling unit. Um, it, it's got to be a dwelling unit because the two family has two dwelling units. So, so only, only half of that house could be used as a bed and breakfast. Unless it's, you know, it wouldn't be a two fam, it wouldn't be a double if, if both it sides be were occupied. Only the bedrooms within the unit would be able to be used to be yeah. rented. Yeah. Whereas the whole unit is the bed and breakfast as opposed to. Yeah, so bed and breakfast, the bed and breakfast is just um, sleeping units. It's just bedrooms. Right. That are let versus a whole dwelling unit that are let. So this would be, we'd be in a high density residential district. Uh, is there any registration requirement or anything like that? Because basically, if I'm reading this right, it would be anyone that has an apartment in an H HDR could at any time rent out to, to someone. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. And again, within the context of we don't, you know, we're not going to get involved in the lease sublease arrangements of apartment houses. Um, right. So, you know, that's not something we, we can really get involved in. Um, and the 50% the or more calling it a hotel was pretty much put in there for the instance when, it, you know, it ends up just being everybody is just renting the place out. Um, then but but I mean, how would you know it would just kind of ha happen maybe? I don't yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of its complaint is going to be complaint driven. Complaint driven. Complaint driven. Okay. It would definitely be complaint driven. Well, what about apartment buildings where you've got a, a uh, manager that lives in one of the apartments, the building manager? You know what I mean? Because that's somebody who's responsible for the building mm -hmm. versus an apartment building where there is no management on site, really. You know, that that in my mind, it's sort of like the double house where you rent out one unit as an Airbnb and the owner lives in the other unit. Uh, so I guess for me, um, if we now have um, basically an on-site manager and we're renting out the rooms, we are now into the hotel definition, I think. Yeah, I, I think what happens, I, I, if I understand your um, your, your comment, um, that only comes into play if, it, if, the, if this multifamily home, this apartment building starts to transition to a hotel because over 50% are being rented as a short-term whole dwelling unit rental. Then, it, and, if, and if they say, yeah, well, it can be a hotel, we have an on-site manager. So otherwise, I don't think that really matters. Otherwise, I don't think that comes into play. But it could be like a lessee could decide to be like rent, rent out theirs. But then as I think it through more, I think I have in my lease, like there's probably some provision in there if I'm running right that says I can't like rent out, you know, or sublease. And it probably could, is phrased in such a way that it would prohibit me from doing this kind of arrangement anyways. Yeah, Tom, we discussed that. Part of that it is we... that a landlord or the landlord's custodian or property manager will 
take care of some of the problems that we're imagining might come up by uh Yes, I mean, it is very possible that somebody can't do this because of their lease agreement with the landlord does not let them do this. Um, so this would be only for, for those that are able to do it, have some sort of sublease provision or some provision that lets them do this with their apartment. Yeah, you know, and, and during condo. our discussions about that, we, we, we did talk about that. And we also talked about the fact that if some of the problems that have you know, everybody hears about with Airbnbs of the wild parties and everything. Other tenants in the building are going to run screaming to a landlord and, and that, that's, that'll be sort of enforced in that way. Um, so, um, you know, trying to think of every possible solution to this is difficult, but sometimes the market or the ownership of the building will, will resolve some of those problems. I think a little bit about, to your point about market, you're just making, Joanna, about um, how things will resolve themselves. I, I, sorry about the anecdotes. I'm just like, it's, I'm able to like put it in concrete terms when I think about the experiences that I've run into already. Um, but if I have, if there's somebody who owns a duplex and the only way that the financials on that duplex work currently with how expensive the houses are, are to rent one of those units traditionally and to Airbnb the other, and that house now happens to fall, or has always fall, fallen into an MDR district, that's prohibited. Is that right? Yeah, but they could go for a variance. I mean, again, we've gotten rid of prohibited variances, so they could go for a variance, a use variance. I mean, the, right. it, from what you're Got describing, it. if it's a financial hardship and, and they can't make this property work otherwise, then, then the use variance works perfectly for that situation. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think it makes sense to have a separate definition. So, you know, back to the question, should it be combined with hotel or not? I, I think it is a different, a different scenario and, and we have to recognize that. And I think having the separate definition works, um, you know, speaking from my experience with um, our five kids, when we go visit someplace, you know, we don't get three hotel rooms. We, we look for an Airbnb and, um, you know, I don't know if we're the exception, but we don't throw, you know, raging parties. We, we have a nice time and uh, are considerate as the um, Airbnb folks usually make sure of that. And they're, you know, they're very, they have this whole system of rating, you know, rating you as a guest. So the next time you go to get an Airbnb, if you've thrown that raging party and caused all sorts of trouble that the Airbnb world knows about that. And we've, we visited some lovely places. Um, affordably with that. So I think relegating it only to the high density residential may work against us. Um, you know, how, how big an issue are these raging parties in a, you know, appropriately scaled, um, you know, MDR? I, I don't know. I, I, um, I agree with you, Steve. I think MDR makes more sense, like allowing them into MDR. Also, I, I don't think that parties are necessarily the bigger concern to your point about like peer-based review systems in these types of platforms that exist. Even VRBO is still somewhat peer-based review systems. Um, and if they're doing their jobs, then the market is, is like handling and getting rid of the riffraff. Um, there will always be exceptions to that, but like it should be a relatively efficient system. Um, the, I think the bigger concern is like, you know, 15 years from now when Rochester's is a, a, a the destination to hang out and you know we've got so many golf courses here anyway but like it is the new north carolina that people are coming here because of global warming and we have a lot of people here and in the real estate market goes nuts um that it's going to become another new orleans where gentrification is rampant because all of the airbnb people investors are coming in and buying the properties and so like um i yes i i agree with steve on the mdr versus um just relegating it only to hdr and um I know I still see something as like a like a 50 50 is is worthwhile um I don't know I, I that that thought is less is less clear I, so it's really managing the density of oh, I disagree on that Brad with respect to your 50 50 like if they can only make it work by one half being rented as an apartment and one half being rented as an Airbnb like we would prefer the half that the owner live in half of them half of it because of upkeep and maintenance and 
if the distinction is going to be between an owner occupied property that has advantages for being a short term hold dwelling rental unit um, and being considered a hotel, I think we want to preference the person who's going to live there uh, just because that makes for a generally a better up, better up kept, better kept up property. So uh, like, yes, if it's going to be a hotel or nothing, that's fine. Or we can give them the variance as Doreen explained, but I, I think we, have the, we would want to preference the home dweller. So, uh, Commissioner Harding, are you suggesting that we allow it in MDR with a, with a, with an owner living in one of the dwelling units? I, yes, I'm, I'm reading my context clues <laughs> as my interpreter, <laughs> my interpreter <laughs> told me what I'm saying. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> it, well, I just want to be clear, or are you just not, don't really think they're appropriate in MDR? No, uh, I or, don't. I want them to have to go through the variance process. Oh, if uh, and to make it easier. Uh, God, I, I don't know. I have to think about it. Well, I mean, don't feel was, bad. Was, we have talked about this for <laughs> hours and hours and hours and hours. So I have to like the fact that you can't my, figure it out in ten minutes is not. Surprising. I have to retrace my steps <laughs> to figure out what I was saying. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, I a couple things I I. I um I just one thing I want to clarify though is that it's not just about raging parties that we heard from the community. They're also concerned about the transient nature of their neighbor and that every week it's a different neighborhood neighbor and, and people really find comfort in knowing their neighbors. Whether it's rental or owner, I don't think it's relevant. I think it's just about the, the constant change in the people next door to them. So it's not just about the parties, it's about that as well that I heard from the community. Um so, but this idea of expanding it to MDR um, is, it, it, you know, I, I, I think I first like to get like a sense from people, does everyone agree that extending it to MDR is okay, but with certain changes or, or without, without re requirements? I think that's the crux of where we're at. I have a question. So let's say Sharla, as an example. I know that district, I think, or that sector is going to grow only because it's close to the water. As we grow as a city, there may be homeowner that decide to move and buy another property and just do Airbnb. What will Sharla, that sector, be? Is that an MDR or that's more of a need? Is it could be also try to do it by where do you see the highest need within the city? of potential increase in Airbnb, anything close to the water, of course, we're gonna see an increase of people trying to, you know, I'm just yeah. questioning not, not all the MDR, but certain MDR, but I, that will probably be more difficult to start separating in that category, so. So the Charlotte area is both um, HB, it has HB in it, but most of the areas where there's a lot of housing that would be subject to Airbnb, I believe is LDR. Okay. Yeah, the except there's a lot of MDR on the Lake Avenue properties along Lake Avenue, but on the side streets in Charlotte, it's low density residential. Yeah, so all the yellow here is the low density. There's a little bit, this sort of brighter yellow, right? And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right in here, there's a little bit of yellow and bright yellow and right here. That would be the MDR if it was expanded there. And then looking at some other areas that sort of brighter yellow is the, is the MDR. Yeah. Can I, can I make a non-substantive comment? Is there, and I, I say this very simple question with the full acknowledgement that I have thought about this for a good 10 minutes and don't have an answer. So uh, do we not have anything better than short-term whole dwelling unit rent? Like, I'm just thinking like if I'm typing a brief and I have to like type that out and our acronym is like, SW, uh, like 
it's that's estimated. very annoying for <laughs> practitioners. Um, that, but I don't, I can't think of anything that's not like that's colloquial or that might be a little bit easier, but that just seems like a, we're going to get a lot of hatred from every practicing attorney who has to type that out or become familiar with that term. Yeah. This came from our consultant. That's what they're using in other cities. Um, because we, you know, it's not necessarily vacation rental. Um, it's also not even, it's not even just a short-term rental. I mean, we could use short-term rental, but, um, or you could probably uh, lose the word whole, but yeah, okay. maybe, maybe a short-term rental. I mean, maybe that's it. I don't know. What do people think? Or maybe, I mean, the, the, it will like by definition, whatever we call it will end up at least being defined. So I don't know that it has yeah. to like encompass everything. True. That's true. But um, I, there's just got to be something a little bit more workable, even if we make it's up pretty our cumbersome. <laughs> like yeah. if we if we call it a rock B and B or something, I don't know. Like makes we can make something up, but yeah, we would primarily try to divert people from using the term Airbnb because yeah. that's not a thing. That's just a marketing right. tool. But right, we don't want to support. You're right, <laughs> but it's just is not. Um, yeah. I prefer calling it like a. Oh, rock apartment or so i don't know yeah. anything anything it's not i um, think we, yeah i think uh, we can come up with something different that's it's yeah. the definition is what means the most and i think they were trying to yeah, address right. the definition a little bit in the title but that's not necessary because the acronym looks like the cat walked across the keyboard you know? yeah <laughs> I, I completely agree i i, I hate right. the name myself so i'm 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 happy that for that direction yep <laughs> how about short-term pita tears <laughs> Oh, now you're going to oh, make us be friends? That's very sophisticated. Now we're friends. Uh, so, well, you know, I'm, I'm coming with the real heavy hitting criticism <laughs> here. The hard hitting. Well, given that there is a lot of, a lot to be learned, you know, ha having the variance, you know, be the path to get them in the, you know, the more restrictive districts is probably fine. You know, what, what's being proposed is a good start. And uh, if it turns out there's, you know, 10 variances a month, you know, then we look and see if it, if something comes of that and make the tweak later, but, um, you know, maybe going and saying they're allowed in the MDR right now, we don't know what'll, you know, we don't know where this is going. So keeping with the uh, approach that's in the zap and, and then learning from it, you know, there's a, probably a one year or three year update kind of a process, like what happened with the last zoning code mm -hmm. you know, it was revisited and there were, modifications made based on what was what was learned yeah and i think that's appropriate for this one because it is a different um and an, an evolving use how, how that, do people that's a good point that, that you know this uh, the past code and this code are, are intended to be flexible and and that when as things change and when we learn what the demand is for these whatever they're going to be called short-term rentals um that we can always amend the code and when we become this terribly hip city, um, that may, you know, be when we do it. So Everybody sort of comfortable yeah, with that? With thumbs up, thumbs down. We'll just thumbs change up. it. It's not, not permitted in LDR and MDR um, for now. And then we'll revisit this issue in a couple of years to see how it's going. But we okay. changed the name. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Relabel. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for that. That was a good discussion. Um, next up is a couple comments that we got on public process. Um, there was, we did get from several people that they needed the entire code in order to make comments on the section currently released. Um, and uh, basically, you know, this was sort of decided early on based on feedback from, from the public, especially during 2034, that they did not want us to, to overwhelm them with the whole code all at once, that there wouldn't be enough time for a thoughtful review. And um, so we decided early on that we were gonna do it in these three batches. Um, and we do believe that the batches sort of make sense together. Like this first part was the uses of the map. Um, and we've also tried to reassure the community that the process is additive so that, you know, when we release the next section, that doesn't mean we can't talk about the uses in the map, uh, it just means that now there's there's more information to talk about it, and it's added on to the information that they have. Um, and so we're going to continue continue along this path unless unless there's objections here or or um, concerns.
concerned that um, we are doing it wrong. Is everybody comfortable sort of with how we're doing it? Okay, any objections? Okay. Um, the other one was, um, we got a lot of responses about people wanting us to, in the new code, to allow for hyper-local zoning or localized zoning, um, relying on neighborhoods to create their own zoning. Um, and uh, I, I guess my, we have a rather lengthy answer there, which we can talk about, but I think fundamentally for me is that's already permitted in the current zoning code and nobody's ever done it. Um, there is a provision in there for developing neighborhood guidelines and code and nobody's ever done it. So- uh, um, I think Grove Place probably came the closest, right? Yes, they did Grove because Place, they, yeah. they created a residential district within the Grove Street CCD. That would, that would be the closest. Um, but even that is limited to just limiting use, uses and, and not additional. But, um, but we think that, um, that, that, that um, while there are certain places for hyperlocal zoning and localized zoning, that it's not something that was contemplated in 2034 and not something that we are contemplating at, at this time. And so we're just looking for a check that, um, that that is uh, a, a sort of um, agreement that, that that's a good interpretation of 2034 and, and where we are today. And we also have a placemaking plan in 2034 that's been since the beginning of the process has been, you know, it, that's been, um, that's, I'm not, what's the word, it's been presented as the basis for a future zoning code. And it's part of a, you know, a well-considered plan that is required for a zoning code. And so to turn around now and start over would put the placemaking plan, which has been adopted into code, it would make it basically irrelevant. Yeah, that's true too. Okay, so I'm getting some nods of the head and some thumbs up. Okay. Okay. Um, we had a comment. Uh, we had some commenters that were requesting more information on the ZAP website. Um, they wanted existing zoning so the community could repair. Uh, compare the existing and the new. Um, we did do that. Um, there is now a swipe map on the website so people can go and they can swipe back and forth. They can see what's new, what's old. Um, so we, we consider that uh, sort of resolved. Um, and I guess we just put it in there in case there's other information that you think we're not providing on the website that could be useful. Um, we're trying to be as responsive as we can whenever questions come up. Um, Kevin's office has been great about Okay, you know, can we do a map that shows where all the M3, the, you know, the R3s and the R4s are in R1 districts? And they do that. And I think so, that's the point of this comment summary is just to let people know that, you know, we've been reading the comments. And when we hear, you know, some comments, a bunch of comments about the, more tools that are needed or information, we've been responding to that on the, on the ZAP website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's that, what we refer to the swipe map that Roseanne mentioned where you could see the before and after, so to speak, with using a swiping bar. But then there's also a map that we added. I'm not sure if you all saw it, that we call it the upzoning uh, or upzone map. That's not not meant to show um, every place that's been upzoned, but the topic that is of most interest to folks is, is what areas have, are being proposed to be upzoned from current R1 to proposed medium density residential. Um, so there's a map that shows uh, those areas so that people can understand the scale of it, you know, how much is actually changing, whether or not it's their neighborhood and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that map is now up on the ZAP website as well. Okay. All right. Another um, comment we got, uh, or another subject we got many, co uh, several comments on, were concerns about enforcement regulations and capacity. And, um, you know, we just wanted to put it out there that, you know, we believe that a well-designed code will reach its full potential and coupled with a robust investment in enforcement services. However, ZAP has uh, no involvement in enforcement. Um, so we are proceeding, proceeding um, with, the, um, with the ZAP um, and the new code. Um, and while we're conscious in the new code of trying to make it both easy to use um, and streamlined, we think that indirectly that will help enforcement because it will be easier to understand and easier for people to understand when things are met or not met. That can only help the situation, but ultimately um, enforcement will not be uh, part of that. Um, and then 
Um, yep. I just want, I want to add to that. Um, one of the reasons why we included this is because, uh, you know, this is something that did rise to the top. A lot of comments were received on this. So while it's not something we can really like respond to directly in the ZAP, um, you know, other than trying to do a well-designed code that, you know, is easy to enforce, but as the city planning commission, as you review this and make your comments to council at the end of this process, you may want to consider thinking about if do you have a recommendation to council around bolstering enforcement capacity? Did you hear that in the, in the comment you know, from the community enough that you want to make that recommendation? So it could potentially uh, be something you say at the end. So just to keep it in mind as we're going through this to keep an eye out for that. Yeah, because I, I know this board hears a lot neighbors that come in that are uh, underlying um, discouragement and cynicism sometimes because they don't feel like the zoning codes are being enforced. And so sometimes this board will consider approving special permits and special conditions and people say, well, they won't be enforced anyway. And well, I could let the board members speak for themselves, but I know that that is enforcement is an issue they hear about. Okay. All right, thank you. And then lastly, what we have uh, was we wanted to address the mapping comments. Um, we have gotten quite a bit of mapping comments um, and we've looked through all of them and considered all of them. Uh, and we have made some changes to the map. Um, what we've done uh, with the comments is for each comment, we've sort of applied a certain criteria to see if, if it warranted a, a reconsideration. Um, so we looked at the built as form of existing buildings. Um, this was raised a lot in, in some of the borders of our NMU districts. Um, existing uses and densities, you know, double checking that we didn't take an area that's mostly single family and upzone it or take a, an area that was mostly um, already upzoned and, and reduce it. Um, we looked at the RTS routes, um, the lot sizes, adjacent building and uses, so adjacencies and also the unique context of the area or property in question. Um, we haven't um, released the changes. Um, we will do that at a later date. Um, and the reason for that is that we are uh, in a series now where we're releasing information, we're reviewing it, we're getting the public commentary um, and we're releasing the next section. And we don't, we want to wait till everything's been reviewed and looked at so that we now have the whole and then we will make the changes and release that as the draft EIS for everybody to take a fresh look at. Um, but we don't wanna be chasing um, changes to earlier stuff as we continue to process and allow people to process and comment on newer stuff. Um, and so that's sort of the plan that when we do the draft EIS, everything with, with any changes that were made will now be available uh, for a brand new review by the public. Uh, as well as the as the commission, and um, with that, if everybody's on board with that, um, that was the the last of the summary we have ready for review at this time. Are there any outstanding questions that you guys have heard that we did not address, or um, any other issues you'd like to raise at this time? Okay, so with that, I would very, I would like to say again, we very much appreciate the time um, and the, the last minute changes to get this done. Um, we really did want to do it before the next release, so we appreciate it and we're we're thankful for your input and um, we look forward to the next time. Thank you. Yes, thank thanks you, to everyone. Yep, thank, thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Right. And with that, we will let you go. And uh, there's still just a little bit of dusk light left. <laughs> Maybe people can, can go out and get a glass of wine or something and relax. Okay? Right, thank, you, thank you, guys.